Carter, an ordinary office worker, was riding the bus home after work and watching a trailer for a major update to the game. The year was 2023, and with the development of technology, the quality of the game had improved, and the era of virtual reality games had arrived. Carter's lifelong game was Above Fantasy, or Above Fantasy for short. This game is less popular than those that came out around the same time. The reason is that the system of this game is so realistic that the difficulty level is quite high. And, unlike other games, where thanks to donations, you can become stronger just by spending money. In the game Nadfont, you pay only when you buy the game itself, and there are practically no incentives for charging. There is a thing in which you cannot become stronger if you do not have the skills. Meanwhile, Carter had already returned to his apartment and closed the door. He threw the bag off his shoulder and quickly ran to the game capsule. It was these conditions of the game that attracted the guy to it. Because this game is no longer just a nerd, but already a mega-nerd. The guy leaned against the capsule, hugging it and saying that he wanted the work to be finished as soon as possible. And today, the game is getting its first major update in three years, and the scheduled time for the update is midnight, and it was only 7 in the evening. The guy looked at his watch and thought that he needed to get ready for now. He pressed a button on the capsule's body, and its lid opened, revealing a chair inside. Carter, taking off his jacket, climbed into the chair and put on his glasses, closed the lid, and a multitude of game windows flickered before his eyes. The capsule reported that iris recognition was complete, and therefore access was granted. The game greeted the guy and told him to choose the character he wanted to play as, and many figures of people appeared in front of him. In the world of this game, you are treated as if you were dead, even if you only have three max-level characters with you. Carter had all seven characters. However, he was about to approach a character who was not currently at max level. It was a figure of a guy in simple clothes. The character's name was Dio, he was level 10, and had no class. Carter touched the character and shouted that he chose it. This is the character that is used for inventory, and the guy took it specifically for storing items. With bright rays, the guy found himself in the middle of some square, and he had already become one with the character. The guy immediately opened his inventory and noted that a new class had appeared, and while he was organizing his items, he needed to collect items that would provide a level increase. The guy noted with irritation that there were hundreds of different items in his inventory. After a while, Carter ran his hand over his forehead and sighed with relief. He approached the NPC, the keeper of the warehouse, Tony, who was an old man with no hair and a long white beard, and thought about how he only had the storage of the village of Evra left. Organizing the inventory took a long time because the items were so mixed up, and the guy asked Tony to open the subspace. Tony replied that they hadn't seen each other for a long time and that the fee for using it was one silver coin. In this game, the system is such that the fee for use increases proportionally to the level. This is also the reason why players keep the character with the inventory until level 10. Carter, looking through the inventory, finally found what he needed. He extended his hand, and it calmly dived into the game window. He pulled out his hand and pulled out a lichen kukri knife and said that he needed to give it to another character. Looking over the inventory again, he asked why he had put all this junk in his inventory. Suddenly, the game displayed a notification that in 15 minutes, the server maintenance for a large-scale update would begin. The system warned the players that they needed to exit the game to a safe place, and Carter exclaimed in surprise that he had spent five whole hours organizing. The notification from the system disappeared, and the guy thought that he would deal with it when the time came. This was the village of Evra, for which the appropriate level is 100, and as long as you don't go beyond this base, you will be safe even at level 10. Carter continued organizing while the system warned that a major update would occur in five minutes. But suddenly the game glitched, and the color of its notifications changed to red instead of blue. And then suddenly there was a bright flash. The guy had his back to all this, and therefore didn't notice anything strange. And the game displayed a message that a system error had occurred, and that it was no longer possible to send messages. Soon, Carter finally finished organizing his inventory and exclaimed that he could do it now. As he stretched, he thought about how hard it had been for him to have to fiddle with this. But suddenly, he began to look around nervously. He wondered why he hadn't passed out. Could it be that the verification was delayed? But that can't be because there were no notifications. He thought that he should log out of the system directly then. The guy put his finger up and shouted, calling the system. A system window appeared in front of the guy, but it was full of interference. He looked at the corner where the logout button was usually, but now it was gone. So how was he going to log out now? The next moment, the guy suddenly realized that all the feelings became brighter. And although the technology was off the charts, could the game be so realistic? 
He looked at his hands, which were glowing slightly blue, and thought that something was wrong. Suddenly, he clenched his fists and thought that it was a rupture in dimensions, and then he quickly started running, thinking that he needed to go there, to the only place in this game where he could play with others, the very place where you can meet other users. When he got there, Carter found only some kind of arch, and the rest of the space was empty. The guy exclaimed in surprise that there should be a gate here, but it was empty. Suddenly, someone crashed into him. As it turned out, it was some little boy who, waving his hand, apologized to the guy. And then he asked him why he was standing, to which Carter could not find an answer, but only stood uncertainly. He looked at his hand again and thought about how the feeling of the collision had been so clear. Beads of sweat ran down his face and he wondered if this place was really real. The guy gritted his teeth and thought that this couldn't be happening. This was definitely a game. There was just a glitch and the touch sensor was probably broken. And so when he got out of here, he would definitely sue the game company. But after three days, Carter still couldn't get back, and he had no choice but to accept that the game had become reality, and he was also a character with a level 10 inventory. Meanwhile, a soldier on the training ground shouted for the others to put all their energy into it and swing their swords. Carter stood to one side, leaning his back against the boxes, while the soldier, turning to another, cried out how such a weakling could defend the village. After three days of struggle, the guy finally accepted the fact that he was now in the game. However, it hit him hard that he became his own weakest character. However, he could be glad that at least he had money. But still, the fact that he was in the game did not calm him down, and so he desperately grabbed his head, which one soldier noticed. Coming closer to him, he asked what Dio was doing here on the training ground. Carter smiled weakly as he looked at the man, who told him that he was just looking around. The soldier asked the boy how about training together, and he reached closer to the boy, in response to which the boy awkwardly laughed and stepped back refusing the offer, and he himself thought about the fact that he didn't even have a class, so how could he train? Suddenly he came to his senses and asked the man why they had suddenly started doing group training. Scratching his chin, the man responded by saying that it was all because of the waves. Even though Evra Village is a peaceful base where NPCs live, there are times when a wave of monsters comes to attack them. You can fight and level up in a team with NPCs, which is much easier than fighting alone, and this is the training system developed by the game company. But for someone coming to a level 100 village with a level 10 character, that would be a disaster in itself. Realizing this, Carter thought that now was not the time to lazily grieve over the current circumstances. After all, it's not a fact that if he dies here, he will then return to his reality. Carter clenched his fist tightly and decided to himself that now he had to try hard. Afterwards, many game windows appeared around the guy. Returning back to Tony, Carter decided that he needed to properly locate his inventory first. He thought that if he changed his character, then he could also change his class. And after finding several scrolls, he concluded that he now had access to a martial arts master and an assassin. However, the guy's character stats were too low for him to change his class. But suddenly he found another scroll that was glowing with purple light. And he noticed that purple color could only be seen when the second stage title changed. The scroll opened, and as it turned out, it allowed you to change your title and move to the second stage depending on your existing status. And this scroll can be used at the altar of the Forgotten Temple, and the guy thought that he can't use it. But suddenly, reading the scroll again, he noticed with surprise that he could use it. Could this really be a hidden part of the game that he didn't know about yet? This game is more realistic than any other virtual reality game, and it has been carefully designed. The guy couldn't find a single bug, and the amount of information provided to users is much less compared to other games. To enjoy the game, you have to track down and find hidden content yourself, which is why there were a lot of bad reviews, but the guy actually liked it. Looking at the scroll, he thought that he had never heard of such conditions before, namely that one needed to be of class 1 or lower and a reputation of 500 or higher. So this was definitely a hidden part that no one had discovered yet. The boy rolled up the scroll and thought that the most important thing for him was survival. However, there are a huge number of secrets in this game that he has yet to uncover, and that makes his blood boil. The guy thanked Tony and quickly ran somewhere. Tony waved at him and told him to come again. Carter then headed to the mercenary guild of Evra Village. He entered the building, where there were already many people, causing the room to buzz with conversation. Suddenly, someone pointed a finger at Carter and asked if he couldn't see that there was a line. Looking the guy up and down, the man noticed that he was not the type of person who could easily afford such a place. Covering his nose because the guy smelled like a loser, the man asked what this pathetic man was doing in the mercenary guild. Carter walked up to the counter and threw something on it and asked to be allowed to meet the gentleman. As it turned out, 
The guy threw an old Class A mercenary card on the table, which proves that he is a mercenary who has gone beyond the veteran level and reached the rank of expert. The girl standing behind the counter looked at the map in surprise. Others who were standing nearby also reacted very emotionally to this. Carter smiled as he thought about how they say that less than 0.1% of mercenaries have such a thing. And the guy had a plan that involved him using this seal to disguise himself as an A-class mercenary. And with the help of a cloak with camouflage charms, he will hide his true identity. Suddenly, Carter reached under his cloak, saying that he wanted to show something. And then he took out some kind of medal and thought that this imperial medal was like a pass to anywhere. But if everyone sees her, then he has problems. Having shown the medal and put it back, he asked again whether he could meet with the gentleman. Meanwhile, the guy was thinking hard about whether they would ask him to prove anything. Suddenly, a step was heard behind the guy, and the man said that it seemed like an outstanding person had come to them. The man was very well built. He bowed his head slightly and introduced himself, saying that his name was Cotton, and he was the leader of the guild. And then he suggested that the guy go upstairs and tell him everything in more detail. The guy thought that there was no way he could show his fear now. Folding his arms across his chest, he asked if he hadn't said he wanted to see the master. Cotton bowed respectfully and said that, unfortunately, the guild master was currently absent. But if the guy doesn't mind, then he can listen to him and then convey everything. Carter replied that that was fine then. He would tell him everything. As a drop of sweat trickled down his face, he smiled triumphantly and thought that now all that was left for him was negotiations. The man and the boy went upstairs and Carter told them everything in response to which Cotton asked him again about what he wanted them to instruct him to go to the Forgotten Temple. Carter replied that everything was correct and that there were no other conditions. Scratching his mustache, the man thought about why he would ask an A-rank mercenary to do such a thing, and then he said that he needed someone to accompany the priest, but all the mercenaries were already busy. The guy smiled and replied that he could do it, and then he said that he didn't need any reward for this, he just wanted to get to the temple in comfort. Hearing this, Cotton, somewhat taken aback, asked the boy if he really wanted to participate as an escort object. The guy replied that things weren't quite like that, and if something dangerous happened, he wouldn't sit idly by. And then he thought that, if he said that, it would be hard for the man to refuse him. They don't need to prepare additional rewards, and from the guild's point of view, as the fighting force increases, the risk of failure decreases. Folding his arms across his chest, the man smiled and replied that he understood and that it was possible. Carter thought happily that he had succeeded, and the man said that they would also notify the client of the changes and then asked him to fill out a request form. The guy signed a mercenary request contract, and the system informed him that a quest would appear soon. Cotton checked the contract and then he said that everything was fine and the client would be happy too, and now the guy could go and tomorrow morning he should come to the north exit. Carter turned and waved his hand in thanks to the man. As he walked out the door, he thought that he needed to go back and prepare carefully, because if his identity was revealed, he would be in trouble. Meanwhile, Cotton smiled strangely after him. The next morning, several mercenaries were discussing that an A-class mercenary would be participating with them. Another mercenary asked what this mercenary was doing in such a remote area, but suddenly they noticed Carter approaching. One of the mercenaries extended his hand to Carter, asking him if he was the mercenary rumored to be there, and he then introduced himself, saying his name was Raymond. Carter replied that his name was Monty. The guy shook the hand extended to him, thinking that at first he had used a pseudonym, as he had planned. But something was wrong. Carter was surprised to find that only four guards, including himself, were sent on the mission. He scratched his chin, thinking that they must have cut down on the number of people accompanying him since he said he would be participating. And then he noted with irritation that this cotton had fooled him. Suddenly, Raymond spoke up, asking if the client had arrived yet. Suddenly, a young girl with red hair that was braided into ponytails ran up to them, and she was dressed in blue, and the girl asked the men if they were her escorts. Stopping, she began to catch her breath and apologized for being late. And then she, putting her hand on her chest, said that she was entrusted with a mission in this temple, and her name is Clara, and she is a priest of the Temple of the Moon. The other mercenaries also began to introduce themselves as Carter watched them out of the corner of his eye, and he noted that her clothes looked shabby. Apparently, she had been through a lot as well. Suddenly, the girl turned her head, noticing someone looking at her. The guy noticed with surprise that the girl was looking at him. The question immediately popped into his head. Does he look suspicious? But perhaps she was looking at him out of curiosity, since it was not often that you met Class A mercenaries. And then they set off on their journey. After some time, it was already dark, and they set up camp and made a fire. One of the mercenaries, pointing his finger at the map, said that tomorrow they would head towards this camp. And it's a bit of a detour, but it's safe. 
so they're not in any danger. Raymond agreed with the man and said that this was the safest way. But suddenly Carter, who was leaning against a tree, spoke up and said that they needed to take a shortcut. After all, if they go to Camp 3, they will stumble upon a cave there, with the help of which they will quickly get to the temple. Raymond approached the guy and said that they knew this area better, and the path to Camp 3 was still unclear. Carter replied that he could find a better way than he could with his eyes closed, and that it would be much quicker if they crossed the cave and went through the Danville Woods. The man cried out that he didn't know what kind of monsters were living in this forest. The guy thought that he himself did not want to go there. But the longer they went, the more likely it was that he would be discovered. And then they will realize that he is not an A-rank mercenary, but just a level 10 character without even a class. He thought that he had to keep this in mind, and he had to never be afraid, and he had to break through, he had to act confidently. And then he firmly said that he was definitely heading towards the third camp. And considering the lady's endurance, wouldn't it be better for them to take a closer path? And then he said that he was participating in this quest for fun, and time is money. Meanwhile, he thought that they must be very angry, since he himself asked, and now he is still indignant. And then he asked Clara what she thought. Awkwardly looking away, she said she wanted to go the faster route. The rest of the mercenaries sighed wearily. And then Raymond said that so be it, but if suddenly something gets out of control, he hopes that Mr. A. Ranga can resolve everything for them. Carter told them not to worry. But he himself was glad that he was able to so easily attract the girl to his side. The next morning, Carter got up and began to stretch. And then he noted with irritation that his whole body had become stiff. But if this were all a game, just one night of sleep would remove all his fatigue. But now that all this has become his reality, he will simply die of exhaustion. Raymond turned to Carter and asked him if they would definitely reach the cave if they went this way. To which the boy replied that they would definitely, and if they deviated from this path, they would end up in werewolf territory, so it would be better for them not to do that. But suddenly the man went somewhere to the side, which angered the guy a little. Looking at the guy, the man asked why he should obey him. Carter was at a loss for words and thought that he was probably very upset about yesterday, but he could use it to show them who was boss. Sometime later, the mercenaries decided to stop for a short rest, but suddenly someone's loud cry was heard. It turned out it was Raymond, who was running from a werewolf, and the system reported that he was suffering from bleeding. Carter, noticing him, said with a smile that he had warned him to be careful. The other mercenaries, taking up their weapons, rushed to help their comrade, and one of them shouted for Carter to help them instead of watching. The guy waved his hand and replied that he had warned them, and therefore, they should deal with it themselves. This statement angered the mercenaries, and one of them shouted that all he could do was talk. Folding his arms across his chest and smiling, he told Clara to stay behind him. And then, he thought that this was a great opportunity to test the strength of these mercenaries. A fierce battle began. The werewolf swung his claws and the mercenary defended himself with a shield. Carter thought that even though they were D-ranks, they were still above level 100. And therefore these werewolves are not their opponents. And just at that moment the mercenary struck. Suddenly Carter glanced to the side and replied that Raymond had been attacked by two werewolves. His eyes darted the other way. He looked at the other werewolf and concluded that this one would die soon. Suddenly, the guy pulled out some small club from his cloak thinking that he had demonstratively called himself an A-rank mercenary. And now it was time to show his cool side. The guy, throwing the weapon over his shoulder, walked forward, telling the girl that he had to help them. Suddenly something hit Raymond on the arm, and Carter thought that these mercenaries had enough skills to catch one or two werewolves. However, if you don't have this skill, it will be difficult to finish the game without getting hurt. And as it turns out, it was him who hit the man on the arm. Carter walked past another mercenary and told him to retreat. The mercenary, confused, asked what the guy was talking about. Raymond turned around and asked the guy if he really decided to join when they had already caught everyone. And then he noted that being an A-rank mercenary wasn't that difficult back then. Carter replied that it must be them. And suddenly the eye of one of the werewolves lit up with a bright red flash. And suddenly something in this defense changed. It became even more frightening and wild. A huge shadow loomed over Raymond, causing him to freeze in fear and ask what was happening. Meanwhile, another werewolf hit the shield of another mercenary. From this blow, the shield broke into two halves, and the mercenary cried out that it was dangerous and they needed to retreat. But suddenly Carter hit the werewolf on the head with a sharp movement of his hand with his weapon, and then he told the man to step aside. Meanwhile, the werewolf, shocked by this blow, stood and looked at the sky, while stars circled around his head. And then the huge carcass of this beast fell to the ground with a loud sound. The mercenaries looked at the werewolf's body in surprise because in their eyes, the guy defeated him with one blow. However, this trick uses the characteristics of magical beasts 
the beasts enter a state of frenzy just before death, and in this state, their physical abilities are increased, and a certain amount of damage is negated. And the solution that the guy used against such a magical beast was to use a calming plant. The boy hit his palm with the weapon, thinking that he had applied this plant to the weapon, and therefore he had managed to overcome rabies. Suddenly he walked forward and told everyone else to step back. And since the guy remembered all the monster's habits, the difference of 100 levels no longer matters much. The werewolf attacked the guy, but Carter anticipated each of his blows. The first attack with claws goes from right to left. You need to dodge the second attack. When the distance increases, you need to attack head on. The boy jumped up as the werewolf reached him, thinking that something like this would make the werewolf turn its back. After a blow to the head, the opponent cannot stay on his feet, and this lasts about five seconds. And then you can strike absolutely any blow. Raising his hand with the weapon up, Carter with a sharp movement hit the monster in the stomach, and then he struck the monster in the head, causing the monster's head to fall back and blood to spurt out like a fountain. And the next second, the werewolf's body fell to the ground, and the guy stood on it with one foot, while blood flowed down his weapon. He thought with a smile that by the time the werewolf came to his senses, he would already be dead. But he was able to put on a whole show. If the werewolf had been in a normal state, he wouldn't have been hurt, because the guy wouldn't have hit him. While Clara was healing the wound on Raymond's arm with her powers, Carter thanked her and said that he was indebted to his employer, to which the girl replied that everything was fine, because it was her job. Carter asked Raymond how he was feeling. Putting his hand on his chest, he said that it was his fault that he had chosen a dangerous path, and then he apologized. Awkwardly looking away and placing his hand on his head, the man replied that everything was fine, and it was his fault too. The other mercenaries were discussing amongst themselves that even if the guy was a bit rude to them, his skills were acceptable, and he himself wasn't that bad. Carter thought with pleasure that everything was going according to his plan, and he had managed to earn the gratitude, respect, and trust of the mercenaries. After some time, the team had already reached the cave, and Raymond said that everything was as Monty had said, but he had never thought that there could be a cave in such a place, and therefore, as expected, they should have listened to him right away. Carter replied that absolutely anyone could act as a guide, to which the man told him not to be modest. Raymond said that after completing the mission, he wanted to have a drink and listen to the guy's adventure stories, and the other mercenary asked him to tell in more detail how he got the Imperial Medal. Carter thought that he didn't want them to trust him so much, and he said that it was not time to rejoice yet. And then he said that this cave is protected from monsters, so they can stay here for the night. And then he suggested that the mercenaries determine the order of the night watch on rock, paper, scissors. After some time, Carter himself turned out to be the loser. He sat down on a stone and thought that everything was going very well, and he even won the trust of the mercenaries. If there's one thing he's worried about, it's a major update to the game. He has raised seven characters to the maximum level and knows the game by heart. But this knowledge can become useless in an instant, so you must always think and act even in the worst-case scenario. While everyone else was already asleep, the guy lay down on his sleeping bag and said quietly, convincing himself that he could handle it. The next day they set out again, and along the way they encountered a wooden monster in which someone immediately made many holes. As it turned out, it was Carter, and the mercenaries began to clap for the guy, and Raymond admiringly remarked that this was amazing, because the Ents were falling helplessly. The boy smiled and looked at them, thinking that it was all because he used the herbal cure for the plague that he had invented while he was the owner of a max-level alchemist character. And then he thought bitterly that he would regret the experience he had before, and the system reported that all experience points would be cancelled because he had not changed his title. After some time, something suddenly attacked the mercenaries. However, the mercenary managed to protect himself with a shield, and Carter thought that there were creatures that would attack even if the medicine was sprayed on them. Suddenly, he told the mercenary that it was best to block the stalks of the husky and the ent, but not with a shield. At another point, while Raymond was swinging his sword, the boy told him that it was better to be more aggressive when fighting enemies with status ailments. After trying it, Raymond responded with admiration that it really worked. The others admired him as well, and Carter thought that he still instinctively gave advice. After some time, the team finally reached some large tree. Carter scratched his chin and noticed that it had to be around here somewhere. He started walking around the tree trunk, looking for something, and suddenly he made a sound. As it turned out, he was looking for some hole in the ground from which a faint glow was emanating. The mercenary asked the guy if he could get through this narrow hole, and he replied that he could and that this was the shortest path to the temple. Raymond asked the other man if he thought he would get stuck, to which he replied that he said he needed to lose some weight. 
Carter, meanwhile, extended his hand to Clara and warned her to be careful. Blushing slightly, the girl placed her hand in his and answered affirmatively. Carter told her with a smile that they were going to fall now, so she shouldn't worry, the girl asked again. But the guy didn't explain anything to her. And then they jumped into this hole and flew down, while the guy was still holding the girl's hand. Sometime later, they finally landed somewhere, sitting on the floor and holding her head. Clara asked what was going on here. And then she stood up and began to admire the decoration of the temple. Meanwhile, the rest of the mercenaries also landed on the floor with a loud sound, and Clara noted that there was space there, and now there was wall painting. Carter scratched his chin and wondered what these frescoes meant. They must be the main plot device and clues. Looking at one of the frescoes, he thought that, as far as he remembered, this fresco depicted a battle between an evil god and the moon. A battle between an evil god who follows the demon god, the source of chaos, and the moon god. Raymond also looked at these frescoes. Suddenly, he pointed to one of them and asked another man standing nearby what this fresco looked like, whether it was really an execution ceremony. The man replied that the other was an idiot and that the fresco depicted an inauguration ceremony and the man in armor was a knight. Suddenly, Carter pushed Raymond back and shouted for everyone to stop and step back. Looking at the fresco the man was looking at, he noted that they were different from the frescoes he knew. Suddenly, he remembered something and he immediately thought about the fact that this fresco depicted the knight he saw in the trailer. Suddenly, Clara spoke up and said that it was a prophetic book. Putting her hands together, she said that she had seen many things in temples, but this was the first time she had seen something hidden in such a passage. Carter, remembering that Clara was a priest of the Church of the Moon, asked her what this phrase meant. Looking again at the phrase that was written on the wall, the girl replied that it was an ancient sacred language that was no longer used, and then she decided to translate this phrase. And the translation of this phrase turned out to be the words, The end of the world has come. And Carter immediately remembered the trailer and the night from it. He immediately remembered the first verse of the song from the trailer, and it hit him. It dawned on him that a new event was currently taking place in the temple, in which he had not yet taken part. The guy thought that it was scary, but he still had to move on because it was the only way for him to survive in this world. Turning to his comrades, he said that they needed to go to the temple. As they walked further and further, approaching the temple, Everyone admired the architecture. Suddenly, they noticed a statue standing on one knee and holding a spear in its right hand. Carter, looking at the statue, replied that first there was the fresco from the previous video, and now there is also the knight in armor from the trailer. Clara blushed a little and noted that it was a very beautiful stone statue. Carter said that he felt like she could start moving at any moment, and he himself thought that it would definitely happen someday. But Klana happily began to calm the guy down, telling him that there was nothing to worry about because the church had already confirmed that there was no risk here. But the guy didn't believe it, but didn't show it. And he thought about how when an NPC comes along, everything changes. And if this statue is indeed the guardian of the temple, then he definitely did not come down to fight with it with such force and will be killed in the blink of an eye. Suddenly, someone exclaimed that he saw an altar, and the system reported that they had entered the area of the lost ancient heritage. The system reported that the first condition of the quest had been successfully completed, and Clara meanwhile bowed to the men, thanking them and saying that thanks to them, they all arrived safely. The guy thought that the mission of accompanying the priest was completed, and the next goal was to change the character. And suddenly the next second, the same scroll from which purple light emanated appeared in front of the guy, and it immediately opened. The boy's eyes widened in surprise, and the system reported that the hidden conditions of the ancient legacy had been fulfilled. And suddenly the writing on the scroll began to glow, and everything around started shaking. Clara asked, confused, what was going on here? Meanwhile, the statue also began to shake and pieces began to fall from it. But suddenly the statue's eyes glowed purple and suddenly the entire stone flew away from it, revealing something black. Raymond, in a panic, drew the other's attention to the light emanating from the statue. Hearing this, Carter looked in that direction in fear and confusion. And as it turned out, now instead of a statue, there was a huge knight in black armor. Carter, seeing this, finally realized that this statue was not a guardian. And this is the Death Knight, an enemy that even level 300 players fight, a cursed paladin who transcends death. The guy chuckled and said that this was definitely not the kind of monster that would appear on a level 100 field. He pursed his lips as he thought about how there were more than 300 Death Knights on the level 100 field. And so his nerd instincts speak for themselves that this is an unexpected event, and therefore, defeating the Death Knight is not the end goal. The developers are very secretive about their intentions for planning all the events, so there must be another way to deal with this. Suddenly, another scroll flashed next to the guy, 
and the system said that the guy had a book of changes and a forced hidden quest was activated. Carter placed his palm on the scroll, and the system informed him that he was to receive the Death Knight sword. And suddenly, the guy remembered how he searched the internet for a strategy to easily defeat a Death Knight, to which someone said that anyone who chose a paladin knows how weak he is against divine power. Among the NPCs, you need to take a priest, and you need to put the shield used by the priest on the Death Knight. If you do this, you can crush the Death Knight, break his shield, and skip phase one. The guy thought that this was exactly what he needed, but suddenly the floor around him burst into flames. The knight extended his hand and asked how the boy dared to enter the sanctuary. Clara suddenly exclaimed, turning to the guy, that it was dangerous. Carter responded by walking up to her and grabbing her shoulder, telling her to prepare her holy shield, and he thought that the trigger that caused this sudden event was the change of his title. So the event requirement will likely be level 10 or below and no class. Clara asked the guy if he was really going to fight, and then she exclaimed that she would not allow this because there was no chance of winning. Carter took the girl by the shoulders and leaned down to look into her eyes, and then he said that they would not be able to escape, and therefore she must put the holy shield on the death knight as soon as possible. The girl looked behind the guy's back at the knight, and he once again urged her to hurry. The girl's body shook slightly with fear, and she gripped her staff tighter, and then her staff began to glow, and she closed her eyes and cast a spell. The protection of the holy moonlight will protect us. And then she waved her hand and pointed the staff straight towards the knight. Suddenly Carter placed his hand on the girl's hand, and the light coming from the staff changed slightly. And then he cried out that it was time, and Clara called upon the holy shield. Multiple light chains surrounded the knight. A shield appeared around him as the chains bound him, and the girl exclaimed that it had worked. Carter, looking at the girl, thought that it was surprising that she used the shield as a rope to hold him. But suddenly the guy said that it was too early to relax. After some time, the holy shield fell, and the knight's sword appeared above his head. The knight lowered his hand down, and his palm glowed with purple light. Carter smiled slightly and thought that the first stage had been completed, all thanks to his strategy. But now the second stage comes, and many swords rise into the air above the knight's head. These swords suddenly fell to the floor, sticking into it. Clara screamed again that it was dangerous. But suddenly Carter shouted out his question about whether she wouldn't recognize him. Suddenly, the system reported that the conditions were met, and the knight's eyes glowed yellow. The guy thought that in any game, the Death Knight is an ordinary opponent, and therefore the Death Knight's business is allowed. The system reported that dialogue had been activated, and Carter thought that if he told a story related to himself, then maybe he could move on to the second stage. He noted out loud that these were all clues to the quest. They were all in the trailer. Mistress Dark, the golden-armored paladin shown in the trailer. She waited for the carrion, who had gone to get reinforcements. However, Pobble never returned, and Dark became a Death Knight, and Pobble, who did not return, turned into a wandering ghost. And this imperial medal that can be obtained by catching the ghost indicates that the line continues. Suddenly, Carter cried out, calling for Mrs. Dark. Holding out his hand with the medal on it, he said that the mission was accomplished. The knight stared at the medal in silence. And then she approached the guy, dropping to one knee. And then she praised the guy, saying that he did a good job. Carter noted that he had succeeded, and they recognized him as an ally. The system reported that the boy was able to find out that the Death Knight was Adelia Dark, a holy knight of the ancient Holy Kingdom. Adelia said that a lot of time has passed. She was defeated and lost her god. The wait lasted forever, and many comrades died and she began to list names. However, Carter could not hear a single name, as if the noise had been deliberately added. Looking at the medal, he thought that it seemed that not all the conditions were met. He began to think actively, trying to understand what else he might have missed. Meanwhile, the knight raised her sword in front of her, from which bright lines of light emanated, and she said that it awakened forgotten hope. And then she swung her sword sharply. The sword landed right on the guy's shoulder, causing him to flinch, and he thought that it looked like the inauguration ceremony shown in the fresco. Suddenly, he remembered the words from the trailer. You will blossom even in war. It looked like a flower. The guy dropped to one knee, thinking that all the clues were in the trailer, but something was missing. Based on the lyrics of the song, could it be that Dark is not only waiting for factions and reinforcements, could it be that she is waiting for the one she loves? He thought that the event had already been triggered, which meant that he now had a clue, and therefore he must understand if there is something here connected with the person she is waiting for. He suddenly remembered that he had an A-rank mercenary card, and it was from the Tantu temple that was connected to the ancient royal family. And this is no coincidence. As the update progressed, existing items found new uses. And he already told Dark out loud that, although she was cursed to become a Death Knight, 
someone else was waiting in the body of the undead. And then he held out his hand with the card and asked her if it belonged to her. Suddenly, Dark shuddered with her whole body and took a step back. Her sword fell from her hands. The system reported that Adelia's expectation was satisfied, and she earned the right to reach the path of truth. And suddenly, the armor on her body began to crack, revealing her skin. Her eyes were still black, but her light hair and fair skin were showing through. She asked if he still loved her, even if she thirsted for blood, even if her skin rotted and dried out. She fell limply to the floor, and the guy thought irritably about how he was supposed to know. Dark said that Carter saved her between the light and the dark. His spirit makes her tremble. Carter told her that he was not the one she was waiting for. Handing her the map, he said that he was just a messenger who had brought his things. The woman sadly replied that she knew. She reached out to the map with shaking hands, one of which was still shackled by armor. She touched it, and suddenly there was a bright flash and she asked for her man to be sent to heaven. She, pressing the card to her chest and getting rid of the dark armor, smiled and said with tears in her eyes that he was her flower, her son, and her truth. Suddenly, the system reported that the story of the fallen paladin was complete, and the reward was the sword of the place of the ancient dead. The reward attribute was the energy of life. The system reported that the user's state was changing as new characteristics were added, and suddenly, the guy's entire body turned into static. He looked at his shaking hands, which were pixelated, and suddenly there was a bright flash. Suddenly, Carter, lying on the bed, opened his eyes. Standing up and looking around, he discovered that he was in his room. Smiling nervously, he said that it was all a dream, because a game can't become reality. Suddenly, he remembered everything he had done, and the smile fell from his face. Looking at his hands, he wondered if he was sad to go back. But suddenly, he woke up again from someone's loud scream. As it turned out, it was Clara who later asked how the guy was feeling. Clutching his head, the guy noted that this was not a dream after all, and the girl shouted to the others that Monty had woken up. The mercenaries immediately ran to the tent where the guy was. Some fell on their knees before him, but they were all very worried about him, and now they were glad that he had woken up. Carter, annoyed, thought that those guys had run away as soon as the death knight appeared, but he only said that he was fine. The mercenaries left the tent, allowing the guy to rest alone. Suddenly an icon with a new sword appeared above the guy's head, and he said that it was the first time he saw a detailed item, and why did it have such special restrictions? He thought while sitting on the ground that this was expected, but there were too many changes. He could only find out that the core of this update was the ancient Holy Kingdom. Carter swore under his breath. He thought that he had never imagined that his advantages would end like this, and since his life now depended on it, he needed to be more careful. Carter stood up and walked out of the tent. Clara, noticing him, asked him again how he was feeling, to which the guy replied that he was fine, and then he told her to take the mercenaries and complete the mission, and he had some business at the altar. Arriving at the altar, he took out a scroll from his inventory. Opening it, he thought that there was no longer any need to doubt. The system reported that the title is being replaced. Suddenly, he felt the very energy that the Death Knight had instilled in him, and suddenly he saw the sword she was using. Small lightning bolts ran from the scroll, and the system reported that the replacement was successful, and now his title was general. The system notified him several times that his level had increased, and the guy thought that experience points from the monsters he caught were accumulating, and he noted that this was the first time he had heard of such an increase. Looking at the specs, he noted that it was a normal level. So was he overdoing his expectations? Clara told the guy that they had completed the mission, and therefore they needed to return to the village. Suddenly, she asked him if everything was okay. Carter looked at her, smiled slightly, and said that everything was fine. After some time, they finally returned to the village of Evra. Raymond said that as expected, A-rank special training is not easy, and yet he feels stronger. Carter thought that he used it to level up. The man suggested that the boy return to the guild and report, to which he replied that he was tired and did not ask for a reward at all. Suddenly, Clara cried out that although the boy did not want to receive the reward, but since special circumstances arose, the Church of the Moon would provide him with a reward. Raymond told Carrier not to be so mean and offered him a drink. The boy thought he sounded like an older brother. And then he thought, he was attached to these guys, but now he has things to do first. And then he turned and walked away, waving his hand, and said that he had urgent business. And he himself thought that it would be better for him to stay away, since he had lied about his identity. The mercenaries looked after him with disappointment and sadness. Once he reached the room, Carter was finally able to remove his hood, and then he told himself that now he needed to seriously prepare. The reason he took such a risk and measured the title was because of the monster wave. Carter brought up the status window and a blue game window appeared in front of him. In this window, he noticed the class Forgotten Swordsman, 
and he noted that, as expected, this was the first time he saw it. He thought that it might be related to the Death Knight and Adelia Dark, because the red energy he received from the Death Knight was the key to the shift. He thought that he needed to calm down, because this wasn't the first time he was leveling up a character. I don't know anything. But suddenly he came to his senses. All other max-level characters have been leveled up following his path, but the difference now is that it's now a reality. Carter clenched his fist and told himself again that his yellow wave of monsters. And so he needs to focus only on this. He thought that now he needed to test the skills he had gained when he changed his title. The first skill was Vow of Liberation, which could neutralize all of the target's deviations by consuming the stamina of the one who uses the ability, and 10% of the caster's stats would be lost whenever he made a contract. Carter wondered if this was too risky. Isn't it a good skill to destroy characteristics? And if the subject is stronger than him, the skill won't work. And if he is weaker, it will be useless. Is that good? The next skill was cutting. Carter asked in shock if this was just a normal hit. However, this was also a skill, so he decided to try it out. And suddenly the space under his feet glowed red. The wind picked up and the system reported that the skill would change accordingly depending on the player's status. The boy looked at his hand and noted that it was the red energy he had received from the Death Knight. Suddenly, the system reported that the power of the Forgotten Swordsman recognized the Seal of Fire, and the skill Cut was changed. Opening his eyes again when everything had become quiet, Carter saw a window in front of him that talked about the firegrass technique. The guy thought that this was incredible. The skill development conditions appeared before him, the fourth of which was unknown, and Carter now understood why he had such a title. After all, his skills are now modified by the power received from the Death Knight. He noted that the flame essence, which is the condition for skill development, is stored in the inventory of one in another city. While packing his things, the guy thought that first of all he needed to level up to improve his skills. After some time, he reached a place where he began to kill level 83 armored turtles. He remembered that these monsters were big, but slow. Suddenly the turtle struck with its big paw, but the boy dodged and struck with his sword, thinking that if he dodged and aimed at weak points, the difference in levels would be easy to overcome. Carter was already level 36. After killing the turtle, he noted that it was not for nothing that he raised the sword to the maximum level. However, if he had a better sword instead of this basic one, he would have been able to do it faster, but he couldn't use the weapon he had in his inventory since it didn't match his level. Thinking that he still had a lot of work to do, he continued to kill turtles, raising his skill level. He had to go further because who if not him? After some time, the guy's skill level was 38.4 out of 100. And after some time, Carter finally reached level 50 and he leaned tiredly on his sword. There were a lot of dead turtles around and the guy fell to his knees on the ground. His face looked tired and he thought that he was on the verge of collapse. But now he just needed to take the items and that was it. Meanwhile, there were five and a half hours left before the wave of monsters. Meanwhile, the knights in the city were preparing with all their might for this wave of monsters. Meanwhile, they were getting closer and closer to the city walls. Having noticed them, the archers were ordered to stand at the ready and then a multitude of arrows began to fly at the monsters from above. These arrows hit the monsters, sticking into their bodies. The knights were ordered to use shields, and they held them out in front of them, and a fierce battle began. The commander cried out that ranks number three were disorganized, and he ordered that this be corrected. He ordered the spearmen to remain in formation. Suddenly, someone quickly moved past him to have lunch, and then this someone, with a sharp movement of his hand, cut the monster with a sword. The knight, noticing this man, joyfully cried out that this was the mercenary Monty. The knight, shaking his hand, thanked him and said that it seemed the boy had gained some fame. Suddenly the knight noticed that the guy looked somehow familiar, which made him shudder. Carter thought that he actually knew this NPC. The knight asked the guy where they could have met, in response to which the guy only replied that it seemed to him, and the answer was a look. The man said that in any case he was grateful, and it was very encouraging that he was an A-rank mercenary. And then he said that his squad would help him, to which the guy replied that they could rely on him. And he himself thought that the difference in levels between him and the monsters was almost two times. And then he decided to use the confidence lens. Using this technique, he was able to see the health bars of all the monsters, thinking that it was all thanks to the training items. As he cut down the monster, he thought that he was now aiming for only a critical hit. Carter continued to swing his sword, killing the monsters. The knights admired his courage. Suddenly something flashed past the guy's head and he turned his head to the side. He jumped up to strike from above thinking that anyone could kill them with one blow. He thought that due to the seriousness of the situation, he couldn't form parties with NPCs and therefore he wouldn't be able to gain experience unless he killed them himself. 
Suddenly, someone's paw hit the guy, but it missed his shoulder. Carter turned and plunged his sword into the monster's body. The knight remarked that he couldn't believe that he was using a large sword, to which the mercenary replied that the guy was an A-rank mercenary. Suddenly, Carter looked to the side and noticed a werewolf with a small amount of health. He took a green leaf into his mouth and thought that he hated the mad werewolf. And then he suddenly jumped up, attacking the werewolf from above. Having flown onto the werewolf's back, the guy plunged his sword straight into the monster's neck, and its end came out on the other side. The knight whom the boy saved thanked the boy, but suddenly he was pulled back. As it turned out, another monster was about to attack the man, but the guy quickly noticed this and pushing the man away, he hit the monster with a sword. The man sank to the ground in surprise, while Carter noted that all this irritated him, and he looked at the status windows that showed the experience gained. As he walked away from the man, he thought about turning off the status windows for a while. Meanwhile, the other knights continued their fierce battle. Carter looked to the side and saw several praying mantises there, which were low on health. He gripped his sword tighter, and then he quickly ran towards them, thinking that they were the very prey he was looking for. With a sharp movement of his hand, he swung his sword, striking at the bodies of the monsters and killing one of them. The guy killed the second one, and the knight fell to the ground, screaming that the attack was not too strong and the monsters would strike back. Moving deftly, Carter replied that it would not be so, and then he struck the third monster, killing it. The knight asked the boy why he would attack like that. Carter then swung his sword around himself, killing another monster, and then he plunged his sword into the last fifth monster, and suddenly there was an explosion. The knight stared at this in surprise, not expecting the guy to use magic. They asked in surprise if this guy was really a magic swordsman. The monsters were blown to pieces by the explosion, and the knights exclaimed that it seemed the rumor that he had received the Imperial Medal was true. Some time ago, Carter sat down tiredly on the ground and noted that he had finally reached level 100, and now he had unlocked a new skill, Explosion. The guy began to read the description of the skill, and he became more and more surprised. Standing up on his feet, he asked again whether he could now really blow up up to five characters that he touched with the tip of his sword. As he pictured this in his mind, Carter began to think that there was a downside to such skills, as they could also affect the caster. Then, an idea suddenly occurred to him and he grinned. As it turned out, Carrier managed to find armor in his inventory that protected him from fire. The armor glittered in the sun, and the guy thought that he was now completely resistant to explosions. And then he rushed forward to attack again. He ran forward quickly, swinging his sword, leaving a trail of explosions behind him. He was now invulnerable to fire, but the monsters were very vulnerable. Suddenly, someone shouted that a huge monster had appeared on the battlefield, which made the guy freeze. As it turned out, this huge monster was a level 150 guillotine bear. The bear growled loudly, and Carter thought that he was much higher than the average level of Evra Village, so it was better to leave it to the guard troops and avoid the mercenaries. But suddenly the knights cried out that they must leave this monte. The guy awkwardly said that such special treatment was unacceptable, and then he still stepped forward and stood in front of the monster, saying that he was going to catch him anyway. The bear quickly rushed forward, raising his paw to strike. Having reached the guy, he struck with his huge paw at the place where the guy was standing, but he managed to dodge by jumping away. Then Carter swung his sword, slicing open the beast's face, sending blood spurting out in all directions. Suddenly the monster froze, and Carter thought that it might seem like this monster was attacking recklessly, but it also had habits. The bear then rushed forward at the guy again, but he dodged again, noting that since the skin was thick, the damage from the explosion was small. Carter began to run away from the monster, thinking that in order to prepare for this, he had focused on agility. Suddenly he turned sharply, and again he ran forward while the bear chased him, thinking that he needed to jump into the crowd of monsters. Bursting into the crowd of monsters, Carter began to swing his sword, sweeping them out of his way. He thought about the monsters chasing him, not realizing that their blood was being shed in vain. Suddenly, the guy turned around sharply and started breaking. And, as it turned out, he had a small bottle in his hand, and he said goodbye to the bear with a smile on his face. And then he threw the bottle at the bear, causing it to shatter into pieces and the liquid to fly in all directions. The bear looked at his paws in confusion, and Carter suddenly screamed sharply using his new ability, and suddenly the bear's entire body was on fire, causing him to scream in pain. Carter watched this action with a smile. The fire disappeared and the bear began to fall to the ground. And then he fell to the ground with a dull sound, raising dust, and the knights cried out joyfully. The monsters that sat in the forest, hiding from the sight of people, were very frightened. Carter then jumped high into the air again, charging at the crowd of monsters, and he cried out that art was an explosion. 
Some time later, a cart was slowly driving along the road. Suddenly, someone stopped the cart and said that there would now be a short inspection. The man walked further, looking into the cart, and it seemed he recognized someone. As it turned out, Carter was lying in the cart, sprawled on the hay. The man happily said that he had heard of his activities in the village of Evra, and then he asked him if he was heading to River North. And then the man said it was an honor to meet him, and he looked forward to the next time, and Carter waved his hand awkwardly and laughed. The cart wheel hit the ground, and the system announced that they had entered the Paramount Plain. Sitting in the cart, Carter thought that it seemed like just yesterday he had no idea how a level 10 personnel could survive, and now he had already reached 80. He called up the skill development conditions window again and thought that choosing explosion was the right decision. He thought that now he was going to the storage in North River for the essence of flame. There, he would be able to take items into his inventory upon reaching level 109. Scratching his chin, he wondered what else he needed to do. And then, he turned to the cab driver and asked him if he could ask a question, to which the man replied that he could ask about anything. The guy asked if there was any news from the Empire, the man thought. And then he began to tell, saying that about ten days ago, a group of bandits raised an uprising in the West. And the third prince also recruits troops for himself. Carter thought that he remembered going through this quest with another character, and that he might have established a relationship with the third prince of the Empire. The cabman said that where they were going, the number of missing people was increasing, and the Lord was having a hard time. Carter pulled out a silver coin and thought that it seemed like the plans were a little off. He thanked the man for the information and gave him a coin, and then he asked him if he could give him a lift somewhere. Carter climbed out of the wagon and removed his hood, noting that he found it frustrating having to hide his identity, and then he began to look into the distance at some plane. Carter thought that this place reminded him of some kind of hidden quest, and he thought of the cave he had reached, that it was a slave trader's cave in the mountains of Tyre, bordering the plains. Hiding in the bushes, he thought about how they were the reason people were disappearing in the North River area. He looked to the side, thinking that he was not going to get rid of them because of a special sense of justice. His goal is the elixir of agility, which can be obtained by defeating the boss. Carter pulled the hood back over his head. Meanwhile, at the entrance to the cave, two men were talking. One said that it seemed like the deal had gone very well. Another replied that he could then take a break when he was finished. The first man replied that of course they could, while Carter watched them from below. Suddenly he took out a rope. The man shouted that they should have fun today. Suddenly a rope began to wrap around his neck, and suddenly this rope pulled him back. And then Carter jumped out of his hiding place. With a wave of his hand, he pulled the rope and the man around whose neck it was tied fell down from the dais. The other man turned around and shouted to his comrades that there was an invader here. But suddenly Carter rushed forward and swinging his sword struck the man, causing a fountain of blood to gush into the air. The man's lifeless body fell to the ground, and the boy thought with surprise that the average level of these men was 50, and therefore he didn't even have to use his skills. Suddenly, something caught his attention behind him. As it turned out, there was a cage behind him, in which sat a small bird. Carter walked closer to the cage and opened the door, and the bird immediately flew out of it. Looking after her, the guy said that they had to be careful, and the system notified that the guy had entered the slave trader's hideout. Meanwhile, there were several more men sitting in the cave, and one of them asked why these picky slave traders were so generous. Another man, holding a mug of alcohol in his hand, replied that it didn't matter, but the main thing was that they were getting a lot of money. Then the first one asked whether the people from North River couldn't find them, whether it was because they were so well hidden. The second one replied that the other should not worry, and then he said that the greedy nobles would not spend their own money on a search, they would not even think about finding this wide plain. Suddenly a barrel rolled forward. The man, still holding the mug in his hand, looked at her in surprise, breaking away from the conversation. Another man stood up from his seat and asked irritably what kind of bastard dared to disturb his boss while he was drinking. Suddenly Carter smiled faintly and asked what was wrong with that. He approached the men, holding his large sword on his shoulder, and asked if the men had not drunk enough already. Suddenly, someone's hand fell out of the barrel that rolled into the cave with a quiet thud on the stone floor. The men stared at this in surprise, and then they rushed to attack the guy with knives and fists, screaming that he was a scumbag, and did he really think he could get out of here alive? The guy, still with a smile on his face, held his sword on his shoulder when suddenly a flash of light flashed. As it turned out, the guy quickly swung his sword, attacking the men who wanted to kill him. Others also tried to attack the guy, but they also ended up being killed by Carter. The body of one of the slavers fell to the stone floor right in front of their boss, causing him to stare in surprise. A small tremor of anger ran through his body, and he frowned and clenched his jaw. Carter lowered the tip of his sword, dripping with blood, 
and said that he had dealt with the rest on the way. He slung the sword back over his shoulder and told the man that he was the only one left. He grinned and said that this was all so exhausting and that they should finish it quickly. After some time, someone's bloody hand desperately reached forward, and its owner cried out begging for mercy. As it turned out, it was the same boss of the slave traders. He was lying on the floor, trembling slightly, and he asked the guy what he wanted. The man tried to crawl further and further away from the guy, and he desperately cried out that he was only following orders. Carter frowned as he looked at the man and thought that he knew this man had to die. He thought that, however, he felt unsure. But still the guy raised his hand with the weapon, and he asked the man if he ever felt sorry for anyone who deserved to die. And then suddenly blood spurted in all directions. After showing himself a little, Carter found a small key with blood dripping from it. Straightening up, the guy looked around the room in search of the chest to which the key belonged. He crouched down in front of the chest and inserted the key into the keyhole and turned it. The chest opened, and Carter took out a potion of agility, and the system announced that, thanks to the potion of agility, the stats were increased by five. Carter pulled the cork out of the bottle and began to drink the contents. Having finished it to the bottom, he happily noted that he felt that all the fatigue was gone, and the system notified that the dexterity indicator had increased by five. Carter told himself that it was time for him to hit the road now. But suddenly he heard someone's voice asking if there was anyone there, touching the wall of the cave with his palm. He thought that he heard a voice coming through the wall. The boy scratched his chin and thought about the fact that the slave trade was over, so there shouldn't be anyone else here. But suddenly someone's image appeared in his head. After walking around the cave for a bit, Carter found the very place he needed to go. He touched the wall of the cave with his hand, and suddenly everything around him began to shake. And after a few seconds, a passage opened right in front of the guy. Moving forward, Carter looked around as he passed the cages in which people were sitting. These people were unusually thin and weak. They could hardly hold their heads up. They were dressed in some kind of rags and looked more like the dead than the living. Covering his nose and mouth with his hand, Carter noted that it was very difficult to watch, even though he had seen it in the game. He thought that if he had seen this for the first time, it would have been difficult for him to just leave. As he walked further, he remembered that there was another wooden door ahead inside. Carter pushed the door and it creaked open, and he walked forward into the next room. In this room, in some kind of magic circle, a girl was sitting. Her hair was white, and she was dressed in a white dress. Her head was lowered low, and her hands rested on her knees. Hearing someone enter, the girl raised her head and looked at the stranger, and then she quietly asked him to kill her. Having seen the girl, Carter was finally convinced that she was exactly who he thought she was. He remembered that a gang of thieves had sold this girl to a sorcerer, and this minor character was to become a sacrifice. Her older brother is Sigmund, the second in command of the North River Knights, and this incident caused him to appear. This incident caused the emergence of the strongest swordsman of the Luna Church, also known as the Knight of Justice. The boy folded his arms across his chest and thought that the death of this girl named Sepia was therefore one of the most important events. And it's not that the players didn't try to save her, it's just that no one succeeded. Not a single potion helped her free herself, because there is a status ailment called the Brand of Death. Taking up the sword, Carter thought about how this girl was considered a character whose death was inevitable. Sepia repeated her request once more. Carter looked at her, frowning slightly, and thought about how this was his opportunity. Carter called up the system windows, which told him that his skill, Oath of Liberation, makes a Pact of Liberation, and if the target accepts the oath, all of its deviations are neutralized, and the caster's stamina is spent. And after that, the target becomes dependent on the caster, and 10% of his characteristics are spent with each contract. Carter's gaze caught on the words that all deviations in the target's status were neutralized. He thought that he didn't yet know if this skill could remove the stigma of death, but for some reason he was sure that it was possible. However, there is one problem, namely that 10% of the characteristics are consumed. Frowning, the boy wondered if it was worth it to take such a risk in order to subjugate Sepia, but suddenly he came to his senses and his eyes opened wide. He asked himself what he was thinking about just now. He thought about being in a game, but he shouldn't forget that this is now his reality. He caught himself thinking that a man was suffering before his eyes, and he was standing there, lost in thought and he immediately remembered how, without a twinge of conscience, he had chopped down slave traders. Gritting his teeth, he thought that he was not like them at all. He was not a monster. Suddenly, Carter got down on one knee, approaching the girl. He looked at her seriously and said that he would save her. The girl looked at him in surprise, and he told her that there was a way to remove her curse. He spread his arms and asked her what they should do. After being in shock for a while, Sepia finally collected her thoughts and nodded silently, her face looking insistent. 
Carter smiled in response and extended his hand to her. The girl placed her hand, shackled, into the boy's hand. The system reported that the Level 1 Liberation Oath had been used and the subject had accepted the contract, and suddenly everything around was filled with bright light. The system informed him that stamina was consumed depending on the status condition, and if the guy ran out of stamina, the contract could become invalid, and it asked if he wanted to continue, to which Carter immediately replied that he did, and the next second, this light became even brighter. Carter closed one eye and gritted his teeth, asking what the hell was going on here. Meanwhile, the light became even brighter, filling the entire space of the room and blinding the guy and the girl. The system reported that a hidden quest, Saving Sepia, was discovered. After a while, Carter slowly began to open his eyes. He remembered that the light burst out of his hand, and suddenly a hidden quest appeared. But, as it turned out, the guy woke up not in the room. Somewhere, a whole crowd of monsters was running, some of which were flying from above. Knights in golden armor ran towards them. Suddenly, Carter noticed a pattern on the helmet. He thought that this was the first time he had seen such a pattern. Suddenly, a three-headed dog appeared somewhere. Suddenly, something exploded in the dog's mouth, and Carter thought that if this continued, he would lose. But suddenly, a bright flash appeared somewhere above, and a girl appeared in the sky. Suddenly, Carter noticed that she was looking at him. The girl closed her eyes and blessed the boy, telling him that the radiance would come with him. But the next second, Carter suddenly rose from his spot on the floor, asking what it was. Standing up and sitting up, he saw that Sepia was lying on the floor in front of him in a magic circle, and he wondered if this vision was connected with this girl. This led Carter to speculate that Sepia was more than just a minor character. Suddenly, system windows appeared, which said about the secret quest Save Sepia. The system reported that the amount of stamina absorbed by the oath is 90%, and the loss of the caster's characteristics after taking the oath is 10%. The system asked Carter if he would continue with the contract, to which the guy agreed without hesitation. The system reported that the player's power was beginning to be deprived, and the guy's body was enveloped in some kind of glow. This glow also enveloped the body of the girl, who was still unconscious on the floor. Carter thought that he was beginning to feel a surge of strength, but then he coughed up blood, and he raised his hand to stop the flow, and the system notified that the player's health was less than 10%. However, the guy's hand couldn't hold back the blood that continued to spurt out of his mouth and he thought, had he really overestimated himself? Having said how much pain he was in now, he thought about how it wasn't just the numbers that were going down, but the pain was spreading throughout his entire body. Meanwhile, Sepia woke up and began to slowly open her eyes. Carter's body was shaking slightly at this time. He raised his hand to wipe away the blood and noted that the pain was disappearing and this red energy was so warm and gentle. As it turned out, this was the work of Sepia, who again fell into unconsciousness, and the guy wondered why on earth she was doing this for him. A drop of blood flowed down the boy's chin as he pressed his hand to his chest, and the system notified him that he had successfully completed the secret quest, saving Sepia, and that his Oath of Liberation skill had been raised to level 2. Slowly rising to his feet, the guy said how terribly painful it was for him, and there was a pool of blood on the floor in front of his feet. And then he took the girl and threw her arm over his shoulder and, Grabbing her by the side, he began to leave the room, saying that he needed to move her to a safe place. The girl, still unconscious, saw a dream. Turning around, she noticed a guy and she asked him if he was her brother. The silhouette didn't answer, but simply silently extended his hand. The girl, looking at the guy, thought that he was not her brother because her brother had silver hair. However, she was not afraid of him at all, but rather the opposite. Suddenly, Sepia opened her eyes and stood up abruptly. Touching her head with her hand, she noted that her head was so clear now, and she didn't feel any pain at all. When was the last time she felt so good? Looking forward, she saw Carter lying on his side, with several empty glass bottles in front of him and traces of blood on the ground. Slowly crawling towards him, she wondered why this man would risk himself to save her. Maybe her brother had sent him. She looked at his face closely and noted that the guy didn't look like a knight from North River. And besides, his sword remained perfectly clean, and therefore it was clearly not sent by her brother. Here, Carter slowly opened his eyes. The eyes of the girl who was very close to him widened in surprise. With a red face, she immediately jumped back. Carter sat up with an impassive face and thought to himself in surprise that he had somehow managed to doze off. After some time, having recovered a little, Carter extended his hand to the girl and introduced himself with a smile, saying that his name was Dio. Sepia, looking away, weakly offered his hand in return, and also introduced herself and then thanked him for saving her. Looking at the guy, she still decided to ask if he had come here for her at her brother's request. 
Carter hung for a bit, not answering this question, and he himself was thinking about the fact that there is no information about Sepia, because she is a character who simply disappears from the game. All he knows about her is that she is a victim, and Sigmund's younger sister. He thought that even if he pretended to know Sepia or Sigmund, everything would only get more confused. And so, after a long period of silence, he still asked her who her brother was. The girl looked away in embarrassment, her cheeks still flushed, and she quietly asked him why he saved her then. Carter swallowed nervously and thought about the question the girl wanted to ask, namely why he risked his life to save someone he had never seen before. And then he noted that it was better for him to remain silent. But Carter could not remain silent and said that he wanted to hear words of gratitude. After a while, they were still sitting in their small camp by the fire, and Carter thought that this was all strange. What was strange was that they had already talked a little, but as it turned out, the girl did not remember anything. He thought about how Sepia had made a contract with him and submitted to him, and therefore she would have many restrictions for a long time. And then he looked at the system window of her characteristics. And, as one might expect, in it he could see that it had the characteristics of submission, obedience, solidarity, and destruction. He thought that listening meant suffering when disobeying orders, solidarity meant suffering when going beyond a certain distance, and destruction meant death when breaking an oath. His face warmed up a little, but then he smiled wryly, thinking that the restrictions were much stricter than he thought. However, if they had not made this oath, the girl would have died a painful death, and therefore the guy thought that he should not blame himself for the fact that she ended up under his control. He decided that he needed to explain everything to her quickly so that she wouldn't worry, and then he asked the girl again about her brother Sigmund being a knight, and then he announced that he had then accompanied her to the North River. Sepia looked to the side and wanted to say something but didn't dare, which made the guy think that she still didn't trust him. He frowned slightly, noting that to her he still looked like a common slave trader, and then he suddenly extended his hand to her and told her to take his hand. The girl was a little taken aback by such a request, and then Carter said that it was an order, and both his and the girl's eyes lit up with a yellow light, and Sepia, without thinking, quickly took the guy's hand in both of hers. Afterwards, having recovered from the effect of the spell, she asked in confusion what it was and why. Carter pulled his hand back, and then he told her that they were now bound by an oath, and that she was his subordinate. The girl pressed her hand to her chest, and the guy continued, saying that a subordinate suffers if he does not obey orders, and this does not depend on him personally, because they gave this oath to each other themselves. He said that he had to do it to save her, and so everything will be exactly like this now, even if she is against it. Carter, having finished speaking, frowned and looked at the ground, and he thought that the girl probably wouldn't want to follow an unknown wanderer, and even if she were to reunite with her brother, she would have to leave him again to go with her new master. But to the guy's surprise, the system reported that Sepia's trust had increased by three points and the girl said that she already owed her life to him, and therefore she was ready to follow him. With a smile on his face, Carter noted that he was glad that she understood and accepted it so quickly. And then they decided to go to the North River as soon as possible. Meanwhile, a man asked a shaking subordinate, who was lying bowed on the floor, if the victim had really disappeared. The subordinate raised his head and replied that when he arrived there, all the bandits were already dead. In response to this, the man sharply raised his hand upward, causing chains to begin to wrap around the other man's body. The irritated man asked if the other knew how important it was to keep an eye on the victim. And following these words, the chains glorified the body of the subordinate, causing blood to spurt out of his mouth like a fountain. The man thought that at first the girl was caught only to deal with the annoying Sigmund. But she turned out to be an archmage, which immediately changed the intention to her. And if they let her go, then the sacrifice will increase from three to seven. In a rage, the man raised his hand with the weapon up to strike. After some time, another man in a cassock ran into the hall, and he exclaimed that they had found the place of sacrifice, which meant that they had not gone that far from the cave. The man named Victor walked forward with a confident step, and he told them to follow everyone, and he himself would tear the neck of the bastard who took their victim with his own hands. Meanwhile, the sun was already setting, and Carter sat down on a rock and began to think that Sepia's health had not yet fully recovered, which is why she was moving slowly. The guy had a bad feeling that they needed to get out of this place as soon as possible. As it turned out, the guy was called by Sepia, and hearing this, Carter shuddered and broke away from his thoughts. The girl said that he told her that he was a traveling mercenary, and then she bombarded him with questions about where he got such strength from, because she had never heard that such a curse could be removed, and she knows that not everyone can take an oath. Carter thought that she was asking questions just to get some energy, and he answered hesitantly, saying that he got this power from some temple. 
However, Sepia didn't really believe it, and the system reported that her trust had decreased by one. Noticing this, Carter thought with annoyance that he had only just raised the trust level to the maximum. He told her to tell him how she was caught. The girl, without looking at the guy, asked him if this was in order. Carter threw up his hands and exclaimed in response that, of course not. He said that she doesn't have to tell him if she doesn't want to. Sepia brought her hand to her face, hiding her smile, and thought that maybe this guy wasn't as bad as she thought, and her trust increased by one. And then she said that she had nothing to hide from the man who saved her. But suddenly Carter grabbed her wrist and pulled her closer to him. Not understanding what was happening, Sepia asked why he had grabbed her so suddenly. But the guy just told her to look back, and the girl turned her head, and she could see some dark trace which was almost in the place where she stood before. Noticing this sign, she exclaimed that she knew this dark energy. As it turned out, this dark energy was the same one she could feel in the room where she was being held. Victor stepped forward, surrounded by his subordinates, and said that it looked like he was going to have problems. Carter quietly said Victor's name, and Victor asked him in response if he knew him, and then he noted that the guy recognized his mark. Carter stepped forward, shielding Sepia, and the man said that this guy, who looked so neat, like a nobleman, was touching what belonged to him without any fear. With a smirk on his face, Carter responded by telling him to take it as he wanted, and the guy with a sharp wave of his hand threw something towards the man. As it turned out, these were some wooden blocks with a red symbol depicted on them. And then, when these bars touched their targets, they exploded. Carter chuckled and noted that Victor had that power too. As it turned out, these explosions did not affect the man at all, and he asked the guy if it was funny. Carter thought that the man didn't have any serious injuries after all. He was a third circle wizard. However, Victor had not yet reached the fifth circle, having placed Sepia on the altar as a sacrifice, and the third circle was equal in strength to his 80th level. And so the guy thought that he could win, and in the meantime, something was flying at him. By tilting his head slightly to the side, Carter managed to dodge the swift attack, and then he rushed forward with the sword that lay on his shoulder. Victor's subordinate, who was casting the spells, noted with irritation that the boy was faster than he thought. But the next second, Carter found himself face to face with the man. And then, with a sharp movement of his hand, he swung his sword, striking the man's chest, causing blood to gush out like a fountain. The other subordinate responded by clasping his hands together to cast a defensive spell. But this did not stop the guy, and he struck the shield. As it turned out, the blow cracked the spellcaster's shield, and Carter's sword passed further, cutting through the man's chest. Victor's other subordinates cried out that they needed to protect their boss until the magic circle was completed. But Carter threw his wooden blocks down again, causing explosions to thunder near the men. Jumping up to attack the other opponents, the boy noted that he had three more ahead of him. He swung his sword again, cutting a deep cut into the chest of one of them. Noting that there were still two left, he swung his hand sharply to the side, cutting the other man's body in two and noting that there was still one left. Meanwhile, Victor raised his hand up, and some kind of glowing sphere appeared around it, and glowing lines spread through the air. A magic arrow was sent forward, and the man said that this spell would pursue the target to the end, no matter how long it ran, and the man joyfully exclaimed that now it was the end. However, the man's spell did not achieve its goal because the boy shielded himself with something black. With a smile on his face, Carter took a deep breath, and it turned out that he had shielded himself with Victor's subordinate, and then he mockingly noted that fortunately this blow did not hit him, and then he said that this warlock's ability to aim would hit him. Victor cried out in irritation, and glowing flashes appeared from his body, filling the space around him. With a smile on his face, Carter decided to use the explosion again and said how stupid it was, and asked him if he could hit him with the flash. And then, with a sharp movement, he threw something engulfed in flames at the man and noted that, since this was only the third circle, the spell worked slowly. Victor responded to this with irritation saying that if he had sepia, he would have already reached the seventh circle. Carter frowned and said that the man's limit was only five laps, no more. This made Victor even more angry, and he began to conjure some kind of glowing sphere near his chest. Carter jumped up again with his sword in hand to attack the man, and he decided to hit him with an explosion again. And this explosion reached the man's body, a bright flash shone in front of the guy. The man's entire body was immediately immersed in fire. Landing on the ground, Carter stood up to walk closer to the man engulfed in flames, wanting to finish. But suddenly something made him stop halfway. Looking at Victor, who was screaming in pain, he wondered what this strange feeling was. He noticed that his explosion skill was indeed a flame skill, but it looked a little different now. Meanwhile, tears were streaming down Sepia's cheeks and she sighed. Her eyes were filled with a glow and she had her arms crossed over her chest, 
and the outline of flames could be seen around her body. The girl screamed that the man must now suffer too, and flashes of light filled the space around, and chains flew forward. These chains began to wrap around Victor's body, and then they squeezed him hard, which made him scream even louder. Tears were still running down the girl's cheeks, but a smile was visible on her face, and she stretched her arms forward, tightening the chains tighter and tighter. The fire that burned the man's body became even stronger. The chains tightened even more, and he begged for her to stop. Carter watched all this with surprise on his face. After seeing this scene, he realized that this was NPC magic, and it could only be found in later versions, and it was only used by those who had risen to the rank of the strongest. Carter, still in shock, turned to look at the girl, amazed that she could use such magic. But suddenly the girl's eyes closed, her face relaxed, and she began to fall to the ground, losing consciousness. However, Carter managed to run up to her and catch her. As he pulled her closer, he thought that he thought she couldn't control her abilities yet. But she was doing just fine. Meanwhile, somewhere, the door to the office suddenly swung open, and someone, turning to the vice captain, said that he had found a clue. As it turned out, this vice captain was Sigmund, the youngest second in command of the North River. His subordinate reported that he had noticed a trace on the border in the Tyre Mountains, and he continued saying that it looked like slave traders were involved in this matter, causing the guy's face to darken. He clenched his fist tightly, screaming how dare those bastards, and then he waved his hand sharply, ordering his subordinate that they must find them immediately. When the subordinate left, the boy was left alone in the room, and he sadly called his sister by name. After some time, Sepia had already recovered, and they continued on their way, and she, looking around, asked the guy if this was the right path. Turning around, he replied that of course it was, he had told her that he knew a shortcut to the North River. Moving on, the guy noted that the girl still doubted him, and he was just trying to find his way without a map and compass. He didn't want to lose her trust, so he should keep quiet, but he thought he would have to protect the girl, so he didn't expect her to have such power. Carrying the girl on his back after the battle, he looked at her stat window, which was normal, but her class was still hidden. The guy suggested that she might have the same abilities as her older brother Sigmund. With a smile on his face, he pointed somewhere ahead with his hand and said that soon they would arrive in North River. Sepia answered this briefly, and the guy couldn't find anything else to say. Turning back, he thought about how he needed to gain her trust before she asked about her abilities, and if he is not careful, he may even die. The guy thought that he had seen her other side, and he wondered how he could now find out more about the girl, and he decided that he had to try to gain their trust. After some time, Carter raised his voice and called the girl by name. Turning around, he said with a serious face that he needed to tell her something. And then he asked her if she was a heretic. This question caused a negative reaction from the girl, and the system reported that her trust dropped by five points. Meanwhile, within the walls of the Atran Cathedral, a girl was walking, her red hair braided into two ponytails, fluttering behind her with every step. The man in blue robes placed his hand on his chest and thanked the girl for her work. As it turned out, this girl was Clara, and she accepted this gratitude with a smile. The man told her to follow him, to which the girl obeyed, and began to admire the decoration of the cathedral. After some time, they reached some doors, and the man told Clara to be careful, even though she had already completed the training. And then she entered a huge hall. In front of her, there was a throne on which someone was sitting, and a blue carpet led to it. Clara moved closer awkwardly, and then she bowed politely, touching the carpet with her knee, and greeted her grace the moon. The woman sitting on the throne told Clara to look up. As it turned out, the holy Kalaniya Moon was sitting on the throne, and she thanked the girl for the work she had done. Clara looked up at her in surprise, still bowing. Holy Moon quietly tapped her finger on the armrests of the throne and said that the girl must already know why she called her here. And then she said that she had heard that the girl had visited a forgotten temple, to which Clara, without hiding, replied that this was so. And then the woman told her to tell her everything. She asked her to tell her everything she saw and heard. After some time, Clara told about the Death Knight's death, and after that, she returned to the village. After these words, the woman interrupted the girl's story, saying that she could stop there. And afterwards, she said that Clara had done a good job and had helped the Order a lot. Therefore, the diocese will provide appropriate compensation, and the blessing of the moon will continue to light its path. Clara happily thanked the woman, and then she immediately left the room. Holy Moon tapped her fingers on the armrest of the throne again, thinking about something, frowning, she turned her head slightly and called out to someone named Paul, and immediately behind her, a man appeared who was the Archbishop of the Lunar Church, and he asked the woman if she had called him. The woman said that there was no lie in what the priest said, but something bothered her. In response to this, Paul nodded and said that the name Monte 
was absolutely fictitious. In response, the woman ordered the man to send a personal letter to Port River, and it looks like she'll have to follow this guy. Meanwhile, Sepia asked Carter why he thought she was a heretic, and said that most likely those who kidnapped her were heretics. Carter responded by saying that those they call heretics must have something in common, and what they have in common is the desire for power, not for faith. And the strength that the girl showed was simply incredible. The girls froze in shock and asked again. Frowning, she looked down and thought about how she had suspected him all along. And that's why she doesn't even know what to answer him now. She swallowed nervously, thinking that judging by the guy's abilities, there was a possibility that he was the heretic inquisitor of the Holy Emperor of the Moon Church. And then Sepia quietly said that she would tell everything. She told that in her youth she often lost consciousness, and her magical power got out of control. And so she turned to magicians, who told her what was wrong with her, but they still did not find a solution to the problem. Carter asked the girl if it was not fashionable for her to control magic at will, to which she replied that, although it was hard to believe, it was true. But it was definitely not the power of the devil, because during the escape she used fire and light magic. Carter put his hand on his chin and tilted his head to the side, thinking, and he remembered the very vision he had seen when they made the contract with her. And so he wondered if she really had divine powers. And Sepia cried out, asking to be believed, and she said that although she looked frightening, she would do no harm. Carter, feeling his head begin to hurt, thought about her hurting Victor, and so he wondered if she did it because she lost her memory, or if she wasn't human at all. The guy, looking at the girl, noted that she had started telling the story too suddenly, and so perhaps he had scared her. The girl's face darkened, and she looked away and asked him if he was the Inquisitor of the Holy Emperor. Carter waved his hands and noted that he had said that he was just a mercenary. Hearing this, Sepia asked again, somewhat surprised, and then she asked him if he was from the East, in response to which the guy asked why she decided so. He asked her what difference it made where he was from, to which the girl replied that they say that many people from Songwanchen come from other countries. Hearing this, Carter grabbed his head, understanding what she meant, and he confidently declared that he hated heretics. The heretic inquisitor of the Holy Emperor has such great power that he is called the first month of the moon. However, the clan itself is not so strong. If there is even the slightest suspicion of heresy, the righteous one will be immediately imprisoned. And Carter told Sepia that if he were an inquisitor, he would kill her at the first sign of suspicion. And then he asked her if, since they were going to get there soon, maybe he shouldn't tell her about their agreement. Turning his back to her, he said that it would be better this way, since he did not want to tell her brother that he had subdued her. Sepia agreed with this. Looking at the girl, the guy said that she wouldn't be able to get rid of him anyway, and therefore it would be better for her to pretend that he was just accompanying her. The girl replied that her brother would not let her go if she said so. He would worry and would not send her with him. In response to this, the guy asked whether it would be better than saying that she was subordinate. Pressing her hand to her chest, Sepia asked the boy to give her just one promise. She asked him to make sure to say that she was now subordinate if her brother still did not want to let her go. She told him that her brother had grown up in the slums and had risen to the rank of second-in-command, and she hoped that he would not give his life for her, would not lose the honor and rank that he had worked so hard to earn because of her. Carter scratched his head and thought that, frankly, he had thought he would be encouraged by Sigmund's appearance. Resigned to the situation, Carter turned around and, with a smile on his face, promised that he would do just that. He told her that they should be leaving now and the city was just around the corner, but then something to the side caught his eye. As it turned out, several people were racing forward on horses below, wading through the dust. Sepia, looking at this, noticed the flag of the Knights of the North River. And then she joyfully ran towards these people. Carter had no choice but to run after her. With a smile on her face, Sepia ran faster and faster. Carter ran after her, telling her to be careful. And he thought about how his sister and brother hadn't seen each other for so long that even he was worried. Zygmunt rode forward quickly on his horse with a sword in his hand, and the boy thought that it would be good if he could convince him. Zygmunt's eyes were burning with rage. This sight somewhat disconcerted Carter. Zygmunt continued to rush forward madly, and he cried out for the boy to die. Then he pointed the blade of his sword straight at Carter, but he managed to draw his sword and block the blow. Flying back from this blow, he irritably asked why he was suddenly attacked. However, Zygmunt's pressure was too strong, and Carter fell to the ground. The guy thrust his sword into the ground with force, and as it turned out, Sigmund got off his horse and walked straight towards Carter, while he was waving his arms and saying that there had been a misunderstanding. However, the other one didn't listen to the explanation at all. He just swung with the intention of killing the guy. The blade of the sword passed right over Carter's head, 
but he managed to dodge it by bending back, but the sword still caught his hair. He didn't have to wait long for the next blow, but this one also didn't reach its target because he blocked it with his sword. Sigmund swung his arms with force, causing Crater to fly back and the sword to fly out of his hands. And as it turned out, the blow of the guy's sword grazed his cheek. Already sitting on the ground, the guy, clenching his teeth tightly, looked back. Behind him, he saw several knights on horseback holding flags in their hands, as well as ordinary knights standing at the ready, and behind them stood Sepia. Turning his head back, he smiled crookedly and thought that he did not expect any help. Gripping the sword firmly with both hands, he stood up from the ground, thinking that Sigmund was clearly not yet mature enough. And then he thrust the sword into the ground with force, and a barrier appeared around him. However, this could not stop Sigmund, and he rushed forward, asking what kind of nonsense the guy was talking about. But his blow landed on the ground because Carter managed to dodge it by jumping up. And then the guy flew down, kicking the knight in the chest. However, this was not enough to defeat him, and Carter landed on the ground nearby. Zygmunt noted that this was the first time he had seen such precise technology, but suddenly his eyes glowed yellow and he asked about it. However, something suddenly flew into the guy's temple, stopping his attack. Sigmund turned around irritably and asked who did it. As it turned out, it was Sepia, who was now looking seriously at her brother, her hands on her hips. Sigmund asked in shock why his sister did this, and Carter thought that the guy was obviously shocked, and it was probably because they were close relatives. Sepia pointed her finger at her brother in irritation and exclaimed, asking if he had really gone crazy and wanted to kill her too. Both Carter and Sigmund looked at the girl in shock, and her brother asked what he was talking about. Realizing that she had spoken too soon, Sepia reached her hand to her face. She covered her mouth with both hands, and Sigmund asked her, spreading his arms, what it all meant. After some time, they finally reached the North River. As it turned out, Carter had already told about himself, and Sigmund asked the guy again about how he had arrived from the East, cured Sepia of the curse using Eastern magic, and dealt with all those magicians. Sigmund asked if he had understood everything correctly, to which Carter replied that that was exactly how it was. Looking at the guy, Sepia thought that he was lying so confidently, but there was nothing to be done if they wanted to convince her brother. Placing his hand on his chest, Sigmund apologized to Carter for attacking so suddenly, and then he remarked that it was surprising that he was so strong, and he asked if everyone from the Eastern continent was like that. Carter thought that, as expected, doubts were not so easy to get rid of. Placing his hand on his chest, he replied, saying that if he was able to cross the sea to get to them, then he had enough strength to defend himself. And he noted that Sepia's curse was not yet completely cured. He said that as a temporary cure, he used the treatment from the Eastern continent, but Sepia could not be saved from the curse so easily. Clenching the hand that was resting on his leg into a fist, Sigmund asked if there was a way to completely cure his sister. Carter grinned and replied that of course there was, and he confidently declared that he was the best from the East, and therefore he could do it. Sepia stared in absolute shock at the guy who lied so brazenly. Carter said there was a similar case in his hometown, and they called it intangible poison. Treatment requires constant monitoring of the patient's condition, because prescribed medications are constantly changing and it will take a long time to find them. Sigmund asked the boy what would happen then. In response to this, Carter said that then Sepia should go with him. The knight jumped up from the couch and shouted that he would not allow it and that he just needed to get the medicine. Shaking his head, Carter said that, unfortunately, without him, they wouldn't be able to find the cure. And if they delayed the search, things would only get worse. In response to this, the guy cried out that even despite this, he could not let go of Syria. Suddenly, the girl gently touched her brother's hand and called him. And she assured him that everything was fine and that she would definitely return. Sigmund turned to look at his sister in confusion, and Carter only sighed tiredly. Taking her hand, Sepia's brother told her to go to her room and rest as she would be tired for a long time, and he would talk to the master alone. The girl agreed with a smile on her face and said that she was so pleased to have the opportunity to spend time with her brother after so much time. And then she stood up from her seat and began to walk out of the room, passing Carter. And at that very second, the guy grabbed the girl by the wrist, stopping her. He gently took her hand and with a smile on his face said that he wanted to check her wrist. And then he mentally told her not to go far and to constantly pretend to be sick and he had already written a farewell letter to Sigmund. Having let go of the girl's hand, he said out loud that everything was fine and that he would visit her regularly. Sepia left the room, slamming the door, and now only Sigmund and Carter were left in the room. The knight crossed his legs and said that now there was no need for formalities. And then he told the guy with a threatening face that if he didn't like something, he should do it as he wanted. 
In response to this, Carter only chuckled and said that what a coincidence that was. He was going to say that too. Sigmund crossed his arms over his chest and asked the guy who he was. Carter thought that the previous answer would clearly not satisfy him, and therefore he needed to answer honestly. Smiling, he said his name was Dio, and he made his living as a mercenary. Hearing this, the knight asked the guy if he had a mercenary squad, to which the other said that he was just about to form one in North River. Zygmunt then asked how he could believe that the curse could be lifted. Carter thought that the curse had already been lifted, and his sister was now bound to him by a pact of submission. But that was not something he could tell his enraged brother, so he said that, as he had already said, he had experience with lifting the curse. Zygmunt chuckled and countered that this was completely unreasonable. And then he asked him why he had risked his life, and Carter's hands, which had previously been lying calmly on his knees, trembled. This question made the guy look down and he was able to find it to answer. Scratching the back of his head, he wondered why it was so difficult for him to answer this question. He thought about how the last time Sepia asked him, he had given an answer, but this time he had only replied that he didn't know. And then he asked the guy whether a reason was needed to save someone. Sigmund raised his hand to cover his lips and he said that he didn't know if he could trust him with his sister because the guy was too suspicious. Carter thought that Sigmund's question was reasonable and as a level 10 character, he would not be able to honestly explain his actions. Meanwhile, the knight continued, saying that the boy saved Sepia, who was kidnapped by a black magician, and he knows about the curse, which he did not tell anyone about. And the guy with a serious face asked Carter again if he could really save Sepia. Carter replied that he would bet he was the only one on the continent who could do that, and then he suggested that the boy ask the Archbishop of the Moon about it. Sigmund clenched his fists tightly and responded that he didn't trust them. Carter scratched his chin and noted that Sigmund didn't trust the Lunar Church, and he knew that, so he specifically asked about it. I wonder if he was comparing it to the Lunar Church. Which one would he choose? So Carter wondered if he should make a few more moves to tip the scales in his favor. Carter threw up his hands and noted that people were disappearing in the North River, and he could help sort it out. And the boy thought that in order to gain the man's trust, he had to demonstrate his abilities. Looking away, Sigmund asked the boy how a stranger could help him. In response to this, the guy said only one word, Ali. And just from this one word, the knight's eyes lit up with an unkind fire, and the tip of his sword immediately headed towards the face of the guy who was sitting calmly on the sofa. The blade of the sword barely grazed the skin, causing a small cut to appear on Carter's cheek, and he smiled and told the vice captain to calm down. Sigmund looked at the boy with a darkened face, and he noted that he seemed unhappy with the fact that he knew about everything. Pulling the blade of his sword away from him with one finger, Carter continued, saying that the number of missing persons had increased recently and that the crime-ridden North River Alley was to blame. Getting up from the sofa next to the guy, he asked him where the vice captain began searching for his missing sister. As he passed by, he remarked that the alley must be in total disarray now. Carter continued by saying that the back alleys of this city were so dangerous that even the knights couldn't do anything. And he also heard that the city was known for its powerful factions. He said that, however, they had nothing to do with the incident with Sepia, so there might be problems in the future, to which Sigmund only replied that the guy was good at talking. Carter said that since the guy didn't trust him, then he would show what he was capable of, and in response to which the other asked about his talent. Carter chuckled and replied that he knew everything about the world. After some time, night had already fallen outside the window. As it turned out, Sigmund and Carter were discussing a plan to clean up the alley, and the former noticed that it was a very detailed plan and therefore it did not seem like he had just come up with it. And so he asked if it was really his first time in the city. Carter replied that in his youth he had been a military medic and had also tried his hand as a detective. He said that he had no bad intentions, so why shouldn't he trust him? Sigmund looked seriously at the table, without answering, and after some time he asked the guy what he wanted. As Carter left Sigmund's office, the knight thought again that the boy was a detective. Even if he had heard about the alley in another city, he would not have been able to guess everything that was happening. The alley is really quite annoying. Can he really help solve this problem? Leaning on the table, Sigmund quietly said that, whatever the case, one shouldn't trust the guy completely. The next day, Carter was walking through the bustling streets of the city. Looking around, he noted that everything in the game was the same as before. Having reached a certain place, he thought that this place appears after passing a busy shopping street. And finally, he reached the alley the road that leads to the criminal world. The guy thought that since he had already played in North River, he remembered the plot with the alley well, but he was still a little scared. In the world at large, there were two groups, one of which was the liberal group Golden Dawn. The other was the extremist group Bloody Howl. 
As the story progressed, Bloodhowl took a dominant position, and eventually Sigmund got even with the alley for the death of his sister. However, this time, Sepia remained alive, so Sigmund will not touch the alley, and the Flood Guy did not know how the story would develop further. However, the clue lies in the plot itself. He looked up at some sign and thought that Golden Dawn was defeated by Bloody Fight because it suffered greatly from Sigmund. And so it was time to unite them, and the guy headed to the Golden Dawn building. When he got there, he was met by a huge man named Ludens, who laughed out loud, saying that he couldn't believe that the guy was sent by Sigmund, who had never even apologized before. With a smile on his face, Carter said that now they wouldn't have to wander through the alleys. The guy noted that even after suffering great damage, the man still greeted him with a smile, and even though he is the leader of a liberal group, he is still a criminal. Carter headed for the door, expressing his hopes that they would get along, and the man said goodbye to the boy. Carter walked out of the building, slamming the door. Having fallen on the door, the guy replied that half the job was done. All that remains is the NPC's inventory. After some time, someone was using a sword to kill rats with knives somewhere in the sewers. One of the Crimeans rushed forward with a loud squeak. In response to this, Carter moved back a little, and then he extended his sword to the huge Crimea. But another rat decided to attack him from behind. However, before she could strike, she was immediately cut into two pieces. As it turned out, it was Carter who swung his sword sharply, and the dead body fell to the floor. Looking at the stats window, Carter noted that despite having obtained the flame essence, his skill hadn't changed much. Meanwhile, another rat decided to attack the guy from the side. However, a glowing shield appeared around the guy, which was hit by the blow, and then the shield disappeared, and the guy swung his sword, striking. There was a red mark on the body of the rat that flew back to its fellows. Carter screamed, calling for an explosion. And immediately before him, there was a flash of an explosion. Suddenly, someone in blue clothes ran up to him from behind and asked him if he was okay. Turning around, Carter told Priest Krupus that he was fine, and he thought about how his fire resistance had been increased by the salamander kit. The priest noted that the guy was so strong, and the explosive spell was capable of destroying his shield. As it turns out, Carter met this priest after he started the quest. He originally planned to do it alone, but thought it would be a good idea to take it with him. The priest thanked the guy with a smile on his face. Carter replied that thanks to him he was able to quickly sort everything out, and they decided that they had gone far enough and had dealt with all the rat men. Carter turned and said goodbye to the priest, preparing to leave first. Kupris said goodbye to him, blessing him, and the guy quickly went further into the sewer, moving away from the man. But suddenly the priest smiled strangely and crookedly. He took out a piece of paper and read the description. A mercenary who wields a sword and uses explosive magic. And the man noted that it seemed he had found the one the archbishop was looking for. A few hours later, it was already evening. The men in the alley wondered if this was the same bastard. Another replied that Carter fit the description. And then he noticed that the guy was a Golden Dawn Scout. Carter thought that word about him had spread quickly, which was to be expected. As he walked closer, the bald man asked the boy if he was too confident and told him not to relax since he had joined the Golden Dawn. And then he grabbed the sword that was in the sheath on his back. As it turned out, these men were from the Blood Howl. The guy chuckled and thought that he had already reached level 90. And then he said with a smile on his face that he just wanted to see their boss. And if they want to suffer, then let them attack. This phrase angered the men. And they rushed at him with shouts and attacks. A gust of wind blew the hood off the boy's head, revealing his smile. After some time, something flew into the wooden door with a loud crash. And then some man flew out of it and onto the floor of the room. And this man, saying that they had been visited by those from the Golden Dawn, asked for help from his boss, who had long red hair. Carter followed him in with a smirk on his face, confirming the man's words. And then he asked if this was really their boss, and the boss, meanwhile, became furious. Having brought the body of another criminal into the hall, he asked the man if he was really the boss of the Bloody Howl. And then he threw the man forward, onto the floor at his boss's feet, and thanked them for bringing him here. With a smile, the boss of the Bloody Howl noted that Carter was the same one from the Eastern Continent that Sigmund had brought. He heard that he first came to the Golden Dawn, and then he asked what brought him here. Carter replied that Sigmund had given him an assignment to clean up the alley. The man, hearing this, smiled wryly, and then he grabbed his head and laughed loudly. And then he told the guy not to lie to him, because this proud Sigmund would not solve the problem with the help of a stranger. Then he threw a bottle at the wall behind the guy, and it shattered into tiny pieces. And then he raised his hand, cracking his fingers. And he asked if if the guy was sent here, it means he came to declare war. However, Carter only replied that this was not the case. The man froze and asked again, and then he asked what it meant, 
and the guy replied that he really had come here at Sigmund's request. However, he was not his henchman at all. He spread his arms out to the side and exclaimed that he had come here to unite this alley. The boss of the Bloody Howl clenched his teeth and asked who this crazy bastard was. And then he called his subordinates, who immediately appeared before him. He threateningly told them to end this conversation, and he cried out for them to show what they were capable of. And the men ran to attack the guy. The archer standing behind released an arrow. However, this arrow did not hit the target because the guy managed to grab it before it touched him, letting go of his hand so that the arrow fell. He thought that the distance between them was about three meters. There were no magicians here, and there were about 20 of them in total. And then he put one foot forward and shouted, Forgotten swordsman! Meanwhile, the criminal jumped up to hit the guy from above, and Carter began to take out his sword from the system window. And then he swung his sword, striking at the men and shouted, Cut! Trying to defend himself from these blows, one of the men noted with surprise that the guy said, Cut! The blow sent the opponents several meters back from Carter. The criminals exclaimed that this guy was a magical swordsman. One man shouted for everyone to avoid the sharp sword, and another exclaimed, asking what they should do. Meanwhile, Carter rushed forward. In a split second, he found himself face to face with one of the criminals, which he did not expect, and the guy struck straight at the man's chest. The man flew back sharply, knocking others off their feet. Carter chuckled and noted that the man was talking too much and not talking about anything relevant. Placing the sword on the floor, he asked the boss how much longer he was going to just stand there and stare. And then he called him by his nickname, calling him Tusk, which made the man's face darken. The guy grinned and asked if he really wanted him to kill all of his subordinates. In response to this, Tusk only shouted angrily for everyone to disperse. And then he suddenly jumped up and rushed straight at the guy with an axe in one hand and a shield in the other. The man struck with an axe, but the boy managed to block it with his sword, causing red sparks to fly out to the sides. The blow caused the boy's body to move backwards, his feet skidding across the floor. Tusk, grinning, cried out whether the boy wanted to see everything he was capable of. As he continued to defend himself, Carter thought that even if the man was not as good as Sigmund, he was still stronger than him. Meanwhile, the man swung his axe sharply, causing the boy's arms to spread out to the sides. Screaming loudly, Tusk raised his hand up to deliver the final blow and finish the boy off, his eyes glowing with a red, angry light. The blade of the axe met the boy's hand. But something made the man stop and look at the guy with a stunned expression on his face. As it turned out, Carter was able to block the man's axe with just one hand, without sustaining any injuries. Carter replied with a smile that it was all thanks to the level 100 equipment. In the game, this gauntlet is called an artifact, not a regular item, but not all players pay attention to this. According to the game settings, items of unique rank and above are called artifacts, and since such items are considered very valuable, many players want to get them. Tusk asked the guy if he really thought he could defeat him just because he had an artifact. The man screamed loudly again and raised his hand with the shield to strike again. However, Carter responded by punching him in the face. With a smirk, Carter responded to the man, saying that this artifact would be enough. And then he punched the man in the side. The blow caused Tusk to choke on blood, and it spurted out of his mouth like a fountain and his eyes rolled up. And then the man fell to his knees, exhausted, his arms hanging limply at his sides. Looking at this, Carter chuckled and wondered what the man would say when he saw the sixth set of steel gauntlets. He thought that thanks to this equipment, his strength had increased by 150, so the difference in their levels was nothing. But suddenly Tusk woke up. He raised his head and screamed loudly again, spreading his arms to the sides. Covering himself with his hand, the guy noted that the speed of the man's recovery was simply incredible. A punch followed in his direction and Carter crossed his arms to block it. Looking at the even more enraged man to fight even more fiercely, he thought that no matter how unique the gauntlet was, the man could still be dangerous. Tusk struck out with his axe, cutting through the air, but Carter managed to dodge it by bending back, and suddenly he grabbed the man by the wrist. He squeezed his wrist hard and it glowed pink, causing the man to drop the axe. And then Carter, with a sharp movement, threw the man over his shoulder. With a loud sound, the tusk hit the stone floor. However, it didn't end there, and Carter sat on top, and yellow lines appeared in the air, and the man screamed. After a few seconds, Carter rose to his feet and said that the man needed to calm down first. And as it turned out, the guy managed to knock out Tusk, and now he was lying on the floor unconscious. His subordinates called out to him in confusion, and Carter just sat down on top of the man's huge body, holding a dagger in his hands. He told the men that if they valued their boss's life, they had better not get rowdy. And in response to this, the men quietly froze at a distance of several meters from the guy. 
Closing his eyes and frowning, the boy thought that it was over, and then he wondered if it was possible to assume that he had become stronger. Opening his eyes, he thought that he couldn't think like that yet. Suddenly he sighed and said quietly that it was strange. But he missed Raymond. He missed him, after all. He was his first comrade, and therefore he hoped that everything was fine with Rim. Meanwhile, Raymond was sitting in some basement. His hands were chained to the armrests of a chair, his clothes were torn, and there was blood on his chest. The man was screaming in pain, begging for someone to stop. In the same room lay other mercenaries whom Carter had met at that time. Their bodies were covered in blood, and it was unclear whether they were dead or not. Tears streamed down Raymond's cheeks, and his voice grew quieter as he asked for it to stop, and behind him a figure appeared, descending the stairs. This new arrival turned out to be a woman with short red hair, who smoked a thin pipe. The ugly hunchbacked man asked her if she had arrived yet, and called her Mrs. Scarlet. Scarlet asked the man if he had found out anything yet. As drool flowed from the man's toothless mouth, he replied that of course he found out, he had taken good care of it. And he told her that after the wave of monsters in the village of Evra ended, he left. And according to the information provided by the coachman, on the way to North River, he suddenly asked to get off on the plane. Smoking her pipe, she looked sadly at the measured Raymond and said that the mercenaries did not surrender, even after they were caught. She asked if all mercenaries were so loyal. She told them that if they remained silent, a sad end would await them. Suddenly, someone entered the room and called out to Mrs. Scarlet, and then the man handed her a letter with the words that a carrier pigeon had arrived from Arta. The letter stated that a suspicious mercenary was found in North River, and although the mercenary's level is not high, he is quite strong, and he is similar to the monster hunter Monty. Scarlet thought that if they found this mercenary, then perhaps they would be able to find out Monty's whereabouts. Or maybe this mercenary mentioned in the letter is that same Monty. Thinking about this, the woman smiled triumphantly, and she said that they were going to North River, and so everyone should get ready. And then she ordered to kill Raymond, who in response to this looked at her pitifully, while something dark flowed from his eyes. And then he went berserk and shouted that she had promised to leave him alive if he told her everything he knew. However, no one was going to spare this man. And when he realized this, tears began to flow from his eyes. Meanwhile, Tusk woke up and asked Carter why he didn't kill him, since he had every chance to get rid of him. With a smirk on his face, the guy replied that, as he had said earlier, he had just come to talk. He said that he had never planned to get rid of them from the very beginning. Sighing, the man tilted his head to the side and asked the boy what he wanted then. Carter responded by saying that, as he had said earlier, Sigmund wanted him to unite the two factions, and he asked about the fact that it would take a lot of time and effort. And then he asked the man if he was interested in what would happen if he united the alley. And then he himself answered, saying that the man could then become the boss. So Carter decided to put the matter on Tusk, which surprised the man, and he asked again. Carter said he made the same offer to the Golden Dawn, but they didn't like it at all, and they are the type to smile in your face and then stab you in the back. Pointing his finger at the man, the boy declared that, unlike them, he liked him. And then he asked how he would feel if he told Sigmund that he had united the alley, and that he, the leader of the Bloody Howl, would be the de facto leader. He will become the true master of the alley, just as he always wanted. The history of the Bloody Boy group began about ten years ago. At that time, the alleys were arranged completely differently, and criminals could not communicate and have fun there. But one day someone appeared who could change all this, and this hero became the current leader of the Bloody Howl group. He subdued the alley not only with his cruelty, but also with his leadership qualities thanks to which he suppressed the crowd. He was able to take control of even the entire North River, and so everyone promised to be loyal to him. But then, a guy came along and said that if Tusk did everything as he said, he would soon become the ruler of the alley. And the man happily agreed to this. Carter, meanwhile, was thinking that he couldn't even believe that this man would lead me into a trick on a guy he was seeing for the first time in his life. And meanwhile, one of Tusk's subordinates was staring at him. Carter folded his arms and said the main objective was to plant bombs throughout the city. He said that the guys from the Golden Dawn would run out, thinking that they had been ambushed, and the bomb would not be very powerful, and therefore there would not be much damage. Tusk asked whether they would need reinforcements. Smiling even wider, Carter replied that these guys would not touch them, and would most likely even help them, because in the eyes of the people everything would look like this. The leader of the Bloody Howl will prevent the Golden Dawn from causing an explosion, thereby saving many citizens. And not only will he gain popularity, but he will also become the most important one in the alley. Tusk's subordinate thought that all this was some kind of nonsense. Was this Sigmund really trying to unite the alley, turning a blind eye to such dangers? Realizing that it was most likely a trap, 
The man told his boss to think about it carefully, because this was all very strange. He shouted, asking if he could really trust this guy so easily. In response to this, Tusk only told the man through clenched teeth to shut up, and then he exclaimed that this guy could have killed him and everyone else, but he didn't, although he had a great opportunity. And then he ordered his men to be ready to lay out these bombs. The subordinate, gritting his teeth, agreed, but he himself thought that this was all some kind of devilry, and he couldn't trust this guy, but for the sake of the boss he had to. After some time, it was already night, and someone knocked on Sepia's door and she went out to see who it was. As it turned out, it was Carter, who looked at the girl with a smile, removing his hood. He said that they had not seen each other for a long time and he came to check on her health. Looking away, the girl said that everything was fine with her, but she felt in her heart when the guy went far away. It was a strange feeling, and she asked him if it was dangerous. Rubbing his shoulder with his hand, he returned the look and said that if he didn't go too far, everything would be fine for a long time. And he thought about how he moved around with that limitation in mind, but it looked like he would have to take Sepia with him to avoid worrying. He looked sadly at the girl and said that sooner or later they would have to leave North River. He told her to be ready to pack all her things and say goodbye to everyone. Feeling sad, Sepia meekly agreed. Worried, Carter thought that it was understandable that she was upset because she would have to say goodbye to her family again. But he didn't even know how to comfort her. He then placed his hand on her head and told her not to worry, and they would definitely find a way to break this agreement. He told her with a smile that before they left, he would let her look at the beautiful sky over the North River. After some time, Carter headed into the forest. He chuckled, thinking that he was not one of those people who tried to please everyone. And he asked Sigmund, who was standing opposite him, about how they should start the conversation. And then he thanked the guy for waiting until he finished talking to his sister. And then he said that he was all ears. An irritated Sigmund told the boy to stop being sarcastic. Otherwise, if he got too clever, he would cut his head off. And he told the guy that he had been following him all week. And the knight said that it was a wonderful job. And then he asked him if the main task was to unite the alley. Then why did he suddenly need to go underground? He asked him if he really needed the money. Carter thought that he knew Sigmund would be watching him. The knight continued saying that he felt that attacking the leader of the Bloody Howl was an extremely dangerous decision because the people in this group are very cruel and can kill a person without any hesitation. He asked him if he hadn't thought about what would happen to his sister if he died. And Carter was surprised to note that the knight was only worried about his sister. The guy responded to this so that the other one would not worry, because he had everything under control, and he only needed to follow his instructions. Sigmund agreed, and then he said that the leader of the Bloody Howl could not be allowed to walk freely through the alley, and while he thought he was carrying out a task on his orders, they had to catch him. Carter replied that it was, but they must let him deal with the Golden Dawn first, and he told Sigmund to gather the knights and move out an hour after his signal. The knight asked what signal they were talking about. Carter smiled and replied that he meant the explosion. Sigmund noted that this could harm civilians, to which Carter assured him that there would be no civilian casualties. Four days later, the decisive day arrived. Life in North River has been quiet for the past four days. No one even suspected that these were their last peaceful days. Tusk, with a smile on his face, said that they had finished planting the bomb in the square last night, and so now all that was left was to wait. The subordinate replied that this was indeed the case, and that an explosion would occur today at 12 o'clock. Tusk raised his hand with the bottle, saying that their moment of glory had finally arrived. He joyfully cried out that they were lucky that a man with the same goals had appeared, and today, the unification of the alley that they had dreamed of for so long would take place. He thought that the Golden Dawn was an opponent that could be defeated at any time if he tried, but the problem was always with Sigmund and his knights. However, this problem was solved by a guy from the Eastern Continent. Looking out the window, the man replied that there was very little time left until 12 o'clock. His eyes glowed red, noting that time was moving much slower today than it had for the last four days. At this moment, the leader of the Bloody Howl had a premonition that he was being deceived. As a northerner from a warlike people, he could not ignore this. He suddenly felt that danger was approaching. Tusk stood up abruptly from his place, surprising his men. He grabbed the lid of the box he was sitting on, and then he opened it with a sharp movement, and his people asked why he did it. As it turned out, there was a bomb in this box. Noticing this, Tusk asked what the hell this was. And inside was a note from Carter telling them to see what the bomb could do. And then there was a huge, powerful explosion. And at that very second, fireworks of different colors began to shine in the sky above the city. The woman with the child looked up at the sky in surprise and asked what it was, while her daughter happily waved her hands, saying how beautiful it was. The other townspeople also looked up at the sky 
and they wondered if today was a fireworks festival, or if their master was celebrating, or if he was just trying to please them. Sepia, being in her room, looked out of the window, leaning against it, and Carter, who was lying down on a tree branch in the meantime, said that the guys from Bloody Howl were too gullible. He asked why they had planted so many, and he said he had nearly died running around all night trying to replace those bombs with fireworks. Still, the effort was worth it. The townspeople, who nevertheless decided that this was a gift from their master, looked at the sky enjoying the fireworks, when suddenly someone noticed something to the side. As it turned out, somewhere to the side, instead of fireworks, there was smoke, and the townspeople cried out that it looked like a fire had started and they needed to call security quickly. Carter lay calmly on a tree branch, noting how good it was, while the system reported that he was receiving experience for killing members and the leader of the Bloody Howl. Looking down at the active squabble, he thought that no matter how strong Tusk was, he couldn't handle that many bombs, and the rest of the group was fighting the Golden Dawn with all their might. A bloody fight member pointed at the man and yelled that it was Ludens, to which he responded by yelling that they were complete bastards taking advantage of the moment. And members of two different groups attacked each other with the intent to kill, and the system informed the guy that the quest to clear the alley in North River was completed, and his level had risen, and the reward for it was the honorary medal of the Knights of North River. Carter looked at the fight with a smirk, and noted that it looked like the Golden Dawn boss was already on edge as well, and it was only an hour after the explosion, so the Knights would take care of the rest. And just at that moment, the Knights of the North River appeared in the alley. Carter noted happily that they were exactly what he was thinking about. As Sigmund swung his sword, killing members of the two factions, causing a lot of blood to fill the air, the boy thought that he should go after Sepia. Sepia was still standing by the window, leaning her palms against it, and Carter thought that leaving now, while her brother was busy fighting, was the best decision. But if Sepia meets her brother, then Sigmund might change his mind. Looking out the window where fireworks could still be seen, she asked if this was the surprise that Dio had told her about. She gripped the window frame tightly, thinking that she really needed to leave the city. Suddenly, there was a loud knock on the door. The girl did not expect it, and therefore shuddered. Turning towards the door, she asked who it was that had come to her. However, she did not hear the answer. Approaching the door, she noted that this was strange, because she was absolutely sure that she had locked the door. Coming closer to the door, she checked it again, and behind her stood a large man. The knights informed their commander that Zone 1 and Zone 10 had already been extinguished, and Sigmund told them that it was good work. Wiping the sweat from his face, he thought, remembering Carter, that everything had gone according to plan. He noted that the Bloodhowl boss had died and that Golden Dawn had been destroyed by the Bloodhowl raid, and the knights will deal with the remaining members of the criminal group. He thought that, looking at all this, one cannot help but recognize the boy's abilities, and therefore, it is probably better to entrust him with his sisters, and he ordered one of the knights to remove Ludens' body, and then they would immediately leave. But suddenly someone shouted loudly, calling Mr. Sigmund, and the guy's eyes widened in surprise. As it turned out, there was some kind of purple smoke in the air, and the knights immediately asked what it was. One of them noticed that some strange smoke was coming from the corpse of the head of the Golden Dawn. Sigmund, noticing this, thought that this smoke resembled traces emanating from a demon. He noticed something quickly jump off the roof and fly somewhere, Noting in which direction something flew, he thought in panic that Sepia was in that direction, and then he gave the order for everyone to retreat back. Meanwhile, Carter had already reached Sepia, but he met someone there whom he did not expect. He thought that everything was definitely going according to plan, and he wondered where the leader of the Golden Dawn came from then, Ludens greeted the guy. Raising one eyebrow, he asked the guy if they could talk. The boy didn't answer but only frowned even more. Thinking that he hadn't heard the story of Ludens' life, even when he was playing. This is the man who expanded the Golden Dawn's position not by force but by his outstanding business acumen. But he had to disappear after the appearance of Sigmund. The boy's hand shook, and he quietly said that this couldn't be, and thought about whether he really had an undisclosed secret. Looking at the man, he noted that he had changed a lot since their last meeting. Putting his hand on his chest, he asked with a forced smile what business he had with him. Ludens raised his hand and replied that he certainly had some business to attend to. Suddenly he snapped his fingers, and some kind of purple flash flew straight to the door. The guy looked at the door and noted that he had used magic to close the room. Was he really a wizard? Carter thought that he wasn't sure he could beat him, because he didn't know what he was capable of. And besides, he had Sepia as a hostage. However, the next second the guy suddenly waved his hand, throwing something forward. As it turned out, it was a small dagger that flew straight into the man's head, piercing his forehead. But Carter didn't stop there. 
he jumped up, swinging his sword. With a sharp movement, the guy hit the man in the chest, causing blood to spurt upward. Luden's body fell to the floor and Carter pressed down on the sword, driving it deeper, biting her lip. Carter thought he thought he could kill the man with one blow. He reached out his hand to Sepia, who lay unconscious on the floor. And then he pressed her tightly to himself, thrusting his sword forward. Luden's, meanwhile, rose to his feet, and he noted that he liked the guy's attitude. And although he was young, he was experienced in combat, like a real swordsman. As he spoke, the wounds on his body healed as if they had never been there, and he asked the boy if he had noticed yet. Carter chuckled and asked him if he should have noticed that he was a vampire. The man replied that he thought the boy already knew, and Carter thought that vampires were the only ones who could regenerate. Ludens said that the boy's abilities did not live up to his expectations, and he asked what was the matter, the weapon, or was it all his power? Looking at his sword, Carter thought that he really didn't have enough strength, and he compensated for it with equipment. But his sword, although good, was still level 60. He asked the man if he wanted to have a stake driven through his heart, to which he replied that he wanted to talk. To which Carter exclaimed that men were just a huge pain in the ass, and he asked him what he wanted. The man winced and replied that it was all for fun, and he began to take his hand out from behind his back. The guy noticed this gesture. However, he could not have imagined that the man would be able to approach him so quickly. As the fist flew towards his face, Carter froze, stunned. But the next second he held his sword out in front of him, blocking the blow. The blow sent the guy flying back. With sparkling eyes, Ludens looked at his hand, which no longer looked human. And they continued the fight. The man grabbed the blade of the sword and told the boy that he was holding up well. However, the guy could no longer hold out for so long. Ludens waved his hand, throwing the boy into the wall. He rushed forward, asking the boy how he managed to hold on. But suddenly something sharp appeared in front of his face. It turned out to be a candelabra that the guy had stuck into his eye. The man asked the boy if he really hit him with a silver candlestick. Ludens jerked the candlestick out of his head. Carter grinned and asked if he had stuck it in too deep, and he said that he only stuck his eye in on purpose. In response, the man noted that this is an effective tactic against slow opponents. Putting his sword forward, Carter thought that if the candlestick didn't help, it would quickly recover. Suddenly, Ludens laughed loudly, and then he cried out that the guy had passed the test. In response, Carter asked what he was talking about. Did he really know him? The man replied that of course he knew him. After all, the guy is a forgotten henchman. While Sepia was still lying unconscious on the floor, the man asked the boy why he was so surprised. After all, he is a guy who knows him and he knows him. Carter thought that the man had a hidden class and it wasn't that hard to determine who he was, so he asked Ludens who he was. The man replied that he was a thousand-year-old vampire who had lived a long life and became the head of the clan. This surprised the guy and he thought, is the man's level so high to be the head of the clan? This means that his level is not less than 350. Carter noted that if the man had fought in full mud, he would have been dead long ago, and he asked if that meant his clan was hiding in the North River. Smiling kindly, Ludens replied that he was the only one hiding in this city. Carter asked him why he was alone, 